Okay, my, my camera has just clicked on to 10 o'clock, or my clock has, so I'm going to start the meeting. My name is Jill Taylor, and I'm the chair of the People and Health Scrutiny Committee, and welcome to this committee meeting on the 20th of September 2021, on what is a glorious sunny day where I am, so and I hope it's all the same where, where you are as well. Um, can I start by just doing a roll call of the councillors, please? So because we all have cameras off, it's really useful to know who's on the line and to introduce <coughs> yourselves to the public, please. Um, as I say, I'm Jill Taylor and I'm the chair of this committee. Could I introduce my vice chairman, please, Councillor Rennie? Hello, nice to see you people in the room. I'm Molly Rennie, I'm vice chairman of the committee. Thank you very much, Molly. Uh, Councillor Atkins. Good morning, Chair. Uh, Rod Atkins, Ferndown South. Thank you very much, Rod. Hoping you're OK. Uh, Councillor Dunseith, please. Good morning, Chairman. Yes, I'm here. Councillor Jean Dunseith representing Chickroll, and I'm your neighbour. <laughs> Lovely to see <laughs> you, Jean. Uh, Councillor Gorringe, right over the other side of the county. Morning, Chairman. Um, Councillor Gorringe, St Leonard's. Thank you very much. And Councillor Ireland, bang in the middle. Yeah, morning. It's nice and sunny in Osmonton. Crossways Ward. <laughs> <Cheers>. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Councillor Ireland. Councillor Legg, I believe we've got an apology from, haven't we? Yes, Chairman, that's correct. Yeah, OK, so he's not on the line. Councillor O'Leary. Councillor O'Leary, are you there at the moment? OK, I'll, um, OK, if Councillor O'Leary comes in, we'll introduce him. Councillor Penfold. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Mary Penfold representing Yetminster Ward. Good morning, Mary. I'm mm -hmm. hoping you're well and yes. <laughs> good. And <laughs> Councillor Pipe, please. Councillor Pipe. I can hear somebody trying on the mute button. If, if you're here, just drop that into the um, chat bar, please. Uh, that would be really useful so we know who's here. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, can I just remind you all, please, could you, if you're not speaking, could you please turn your cameras off? And could you please make sure that your um, microphones are muted until you're invited to speak? And I think everyone's cameras off. That is apart from myself and Councillor Rennie, who is my vice chair. So somebody's just dropped something into the chat bar, which is well, probably. Let me just check that. Oh, Jill, it was somebody joining the meeting. OK, thank you very much. Not Louis or Bill. OK. That was answered. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Also, I think we've probably got some of the portfolio holders here that I'll introduce as we come along through the meeting. Um, I have a piece that I have to read at the beginning of these meetings, which I will do now. In consultation with group leaders, the chief executive has exercised his delegated powers to revert to virtual informal meetings of, of council committees during the remainder of July and throughout August and September. This decision was made in the light of the increasing COVID cases, case rates and projected increases for August into September. This would be reviewed in September. Members were invited, hang on, excuse me, I haven't got my glasses on. Members were advised that where a decision was, was required, the appropriate corporate director would be the responsible individual to make the decision, whilst considering the views expressed by the wider committee membership. The reports on today's agenda are for review by the committee to seek comments from the committee and support for the direction of future work, and also provide the committee with information to determine if any future any additional areas should be added to the forward plan for further review. So we'll come on to the forward plan at the end of the agenda, but I think um, that has, has read what, what I've been asked to read out. So going forward, item one, could I have apologies, please? Apologies from Robin Legg. Okay, thank you very much. Um, no other apologies. 
at the moment. Uh, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? And on, on this one, could I just put in a declaration of interest for myself on item five about grants and communities? Um, as a chair of the Western Community Group, which I have received grants from Dorset Council um, in the past. And I would like them to give me some more money, but we'll see about that. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any more declarations, please? OK. Yes, sorry. Uh, Nick Ireland, Council yeah. Ireland. I should probably say, as usual, I'm a governor, partner governor for Dorset Council at Dorset Healthcare. And my, I've had, now got a daughter working at Dorset County Hospital as well as a junior doctor. OK, thank you very much, Councillor Ireland. If we could just make a note of that. As I always say, if there's anything else that comes up during the meeting and you feel you've got a declaration of interest, please feel free to, to jump in and let um, let the committee know, please. Um, uh, hi, hi, Jill. Sorry, it's uh, Councillor Adkins. Um, just to say that um, uh, Nick's just reminded me if it is valid that uh, I also have a um, I have a son who is a junior doctor at County Hospital. OK, thank you very much, you. Councillor Adkins. Th these sort of things are always quite difficult, isn't it? Because it's not a pecuniary interest, but I think it's worth for the public just letting the public know where councillors are coming from. Right, um, if we can go on to the next agenda item, agenda item three, public participation. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak today? Have we had any correspondence from them? No, we haven't, Chairman, thank you. Oh, we're rattling well, quite well through this. Questions from, sorry, questions from members. Have any members got any questions for this committee, please? We haven't received any written um, questions, Chairman. OK, so I'm just going to pause in case anybody has got any questions that they'd like to bring in now. John Andrews, Jill. Right, I, OK. Um, and also Nick Island. No, that was... Uh, that was a previous one. Yeah. Okay, Can Councillor Andrews, could I bring you in, please? Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Taylor. Um, mine might not necessarily be on the agenda, but I am really concerned about the MOU still. Right. Um, okay. If if Robin Legg was here, he would tell you about his horrific story um, uh, the other day with Sherborne MI MIU, where you have the ring one one one. Doesn't work. He got eventually directed after coming off the phone after half an hour, um, going being going on to online and being directed to Weymouth Hospital from Sherborne. So consequently really? took his son into Yeovil or his stepson into Yeovil where, where he was uh, waiting for four and a half hours. So the MOU situation, I, I do believe this is a, an abject reason they're going to state, oh, nobody's used the MOUs. Well, nobody can get into the MOUs because of the 111. Then they're going to try and close down the MOUs again. I really believe that when the performance comes out, there's there's going to be a this look look nobody's going to the MOUs well nobody can get into the MOUs so I'm really concerned about the MOUs and they they're a vital service within our health structure within Dorset and uh, they we, all we all we can do to make sure that they maintain them and open them like they used to be open um, we need to do that that's it for me so it's more of a statement than a question uh, uh, chairman. OK, but but in a way it, it is a question as, as to what is happening. I've, I've got two more councillors. Just check in if you're coming in on this subject. I don't want to open this up for a debate because this is members questions. But if you've just got a comment on this item, um, please let me know. Um, what I'm, I'm wondering at the moment is um, as, as the MIUs have been regularly on this committee, whether we need an update on them, whether we possibly need to do a little bit more work on them as a scrutiny committee. I'm happy to talk to, somebody's just come in and said yes on the chat bar. Um, Paul, Kim. Paul Kim, Councillor Kimber has said yes. So what I'm going to ask for is an update on the MIUs. And um, as two councillors have raised this, possibly three as an issue, I wonder if the three of you would, would consider putting in a scrutiny request. Um, on the scrutiny request form, which is on the internet. If not, 
if you can't find it, I'm sure Fiona can help you. And then we've got a basis that what you would like us to look at and um, how you'd like this to progress, because this has, has gone round and round. I think it's been on the agenda since last September on and off. So I think if we ask for an update for the next meeting and then um, have a think whether you would like to put in a scrutiny request, please. Um, can, can, Councillor Penfold. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not sure if this is an interest or not, but I, I thought I ought to mention that my husband is um, has been a patient in Dorster Hospital and is waiting for a further appointment. I don't think that is possibly an interest because I think probably about half of us are waiting for appointments, <laughs> including right. me. <laughs> <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> so um, I think I don't think we need to declare that, do we? Could just check Fiona. <laughs> I'm I'm sure we don't. <laughs> Thank you. But um, oh, I do hope he's okay. Yes, he's well. Thank you. Uh, um, Jill, you may want to check if Bill is here. I saw him momentarily, uh -huh. but. Um, can, Councillor Pipe, can you just I, confirm you're in on the meeting? I am indeed. I, oh, I, that is brilliant. Terrible tro trouble getting into it because my machine was telling me it's not syncing, it's not doing this, and this is all an error. So here I am. We're not an error. We're all here. Honest. <laughs> Lovely um, to see you, Bill. Yeah, the, the, the message is the error. <laughs> yeah, nice no, nice really, to be here. Really good to see you. Thanks ever such a lot for coming this morning. Right. Um, I think, have we got any more in the chat bar? I can't see any more in the chat bar at the moment. No, there's nothing. OK, right. So we'll go on to the first substantive agenda item, which is the Dorset Council support post COVID VCS recovery. This is an interesting one um, and it and it builds on some work that we did earlier on this year and we've asked Laura Cornett if she'd like to come back and just do a presentation on this and give us some more thoughts on it. Um, Councillor Haynes is the portfolio holder. I don't think she's in on the call this morning. Could I just ask, are you there, Councillor Haynes? No. OK, um, if you'd like to present the paper, I'd be really grateful. Thank you very much, Laura. Good morning, Councillor Taylor. Good morning, Molly. Good morning. <laughs> Certainly, yes. So um, thank you for inviting me back um, to give a bit of an update on where we are with our voluntary sector um, commissioning and funding for the sector during the COVID period. So just to go through some highlights of the paper that um, was written, um, over the last 18 months, the relationship between the voluntary um, and public sector has developed at considerable speed um, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we've received an extraordinary unprecedented support from the sector working in partnership with our statutory bodies to support our most vulnerable residents um, to recruit volunteers, foster grassroots community networks um, and adapt and deliver innovative responsive online services um, that has this and this is followed through into the recovery phase of the pandemic. So to date, um, since March 2020, um, Dorset Council has directly distributed a massive point. £1,185,405 um, in grant funding um, to support the, uh, our voluntary sector during the pandemic and promoting recovery. So this has come from a variety of sources, including reallocation of our core budgets um, and as well as on behalf of some of our government agencies, um, such as the Department for Environmental Food and Rural Affairs, known as DEFRA, um, and the government contain outbreak management fund um, called COMP. Um, so this is very much directly um, used to support um, fund support our organisations post COVID. OK, so um, in addition to um, the COVID financial support, Dorset Council has got a core budget um, to support the voluntary sector infrastructure. Um, the main aim of the infrastructure voluntary sector services is to enable community groups and voluntary organisations to develop a greater reliance, a self-sustaining capacity and capabilities to deliver activities and services that benefit the users on their services and communities. They also commission to provide strategic representation, liaison and partnership with other sec across other sectors and they play an important role in helping the council to deliver our council plan. So I can now give an update um, following my paper, my, my main paper in October um, 
2020 um, that the contract um, for the provision of information, advice and guidance has successfully been awarded to Systems Advice in Dorset, which is a partnership between the three Systems Advice offices operating across the Dorset Council area. So this has now offered them security to deliver this service for us um, on a three year plus two year um, contract. Um, and so following market, market engagement, um, the contract for the voluntary community sector infrastructure support will split into two lots. So that's where you have two providers um, working together in partnership to deliver the one contract. Lot one was to provide organisational support and training and lot two was to focus very much on the volunteer support infrastructure. So I can now confirm that lot two has successfully been awarded to Volunteer Centre Dorset um, on the same terms as Citizens Advice, where it's a three year contract plus an extension for up to two years. Um, and the, um, they were worked, like I said, in direct partnership with the organisation that will be awarded the organisation support one. Through the first procurement, um, we were unable to award um, through the tender process because we, for the lot one for organisational support, um, assist did not receive a satisfactory, um, sorry, a bid that satisfactorily met the new specification requirements we were asking. So just to reassure um, the officers here and, and councillors that uh, my team are now working at pace to find an alternative offer and we'll be going out to market um, very shortly um, on because we do obviously do appreciate that the voluntary sector um, do need the support for training and obviously communication. So I did say in 2.7, um, a verbal update would be would be given. So as the update is very much that we have met with procurement colleagues and we are currently reevaluating the specification, which I included in uh, Appendix 1, um, to um, be able to make it more attractive to organisations um, to want to bid into it on a local level. Um, we've had various market engagement conversations um, with our sector support um, and are quite confident that over the next couple of months we will be able to put this out to tender again in a slightly different format and um, making it more attractive to organisations which will then receive a successful bid. I then in my paper went on to talk about um, some of the really great funding that we have been able to offer our groups. Um, so if I take a turn to um, point six, number six, um, where I've been able to where I have detailed um, how this £1.1 million funding has gone out to organisations. And of course, we have still got some funding available for the, the rest of the year, which I have also identified as part of that table. So happy to take any questions on that. But I think um, hopefully councillors will find it reassuring that we've currently offered 150 separate grants um, across these different streams um, to organisations directly working in the Dorset Council area um, to support during the COVID period and of course to help enhance COVID recovery. Okay, so um, the next steps, so point seven, um, Dorset Together, which is the programme that we've we've worked with officers and our partnership um, organisations throughout the COVID period, um, has provided leadership and coordination through multiple initiatives through lockdown and has been strong and effective between the statutory agencies and community voluntary sector with true co-production and sharing of resources and ideas. Um, the, the group continues to focus on recovery of the community and voluntary sector. OK, so the lessons learned during the pandemic, 7.3, um, have shown that the success is also dependent on a shared sense of purpose and a genuine sharing of power and resources between the voluntary community sector and the public sector. This approach will continue to be taken um, by the Dorset Together programme and underpin the enabling community strategy, which my team in co-production with um, all of the above um, are, are currently at the early stages of developing and that paper will be coming to um, people and Health Overview Committee towards the end of this year. So I'm happy to take any questions at all from councillors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. That this is a really interesting paper and, and something I'm I'm really passionate about are our communities and the way we interact with them. Um, I haven't got anything in the chat bar at the moment. Ah, Molly Rennie has just come in. Councillor Rennie. Yes, thank you. I just really wanted to uh, 
just a bit of a reminder and point out um, uh, 5.4, the amount of money that you've able to draw down to, to give to our more rural communities for the restart for their village halls. We all have been talking about how important it is as we're now being able to get out into the community. Jill talked about an event actually that was held on Saturday morning and the fact that people have now been able to reuse their village halls and I think some people will remember the village hall fund and Lois many many years ago and this sort of feels a bit like that again and community work at its best level ever so um, I, I just think so many organisations will be saying thank you because they can come back into the room Lorna. No, I completely agree, Molly. And um, I'd like to say that actually, if you look at the table, um, the Contain Outbreak Management Fund um, targeted and competitive awards, we have been able to secure an additional amount um, from the Contain Outbreak Management Fund through senior leadership team to be able to continue to offer that support because for both our village halls and our community restart elements of that of the comp fund were both oversubscribed and there were many, many organisations um, we wanted to give additional funding to and taking a steer from my portfolio holder and also um, Councillor Laura Miller we very much are looking at um, supporting um, more, more village halls with um, access to broadband, also to um, welcome bids for community transport as well to help the people in the rural villages get to their local village halls, um, medical appointments, etc. Um, and also to support organisations who are offering multiple um, uh, reasons. So, for example, the uh, Wimborne Ca Repair Cafe, which have been successful in, in the first round, but really those that kind of help with all sorts of mental health as well as um, volunteer um, and supporting people back into volunteering to then obviously go on, hopefully, back into employment as time goes on. So, yes, we're, we're, we're very, very grateful to senior leadership team for allowing us to have that additional amounts and because it's it's very, very important we're able to help our really local tiny organisations to restart because those are the grassroots organisations that um, you know our most vul vulnerable residents do rely on. That, that, that is brilliant. Thank you ever such a lot, Laura. Um, I've got Councillor Dunseith coming in, in now and I've also got a couple of questions myself. So Councillor Dunseith. Are, are you there? Thank you. Yeah, she's here. Sorry, it's, oh dear, that's it. Sorry, <laughs> Chairman. Yes, um, it was just um, a question about one of these lots and looking at the notes that I've made, I can't quite see whether it was lot one or lot two now, but one of the lots, I think it was supporting the organisation infrastructure, um, hasn't been allocated yet and we've just been it's just been mentioned and we've been told it's gone out to mark sorry Jean you, you've gone on to mute you've mute you've muted somehow whoa did you hear any of that <laughs> yeah yeah we heard about the first couple well the first few lines of it you were talking yeah, no, about just, the well, lot two yeah. going out again one lot of, one, yeah one of these lots I can't remember now I've got a bit confused with my notes it was either one or two and you did refer to it in the report and it, it the money hadn't gone out and it's now gone out to marketing so it really no. won't go out sorry not to marketing it's gone out to market um sorry. so this is where we invite bids in um sorry. yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's my so, notes again. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, I referred to that in 2.5 um, of, of my report. Yes. So we did initially put this out for tender, um, and the specification I've attached as Appendix One of this report. Um, so it, it went out for um, a period of six weeks, um, and unfortunately, we did not receive um, a, a, any bids that were. Um, what we wanted for the organisation going forward. Um, so which, of course, in summary, is a full infrastructure for organisational support for the whole of the Dorset Council area, but offering some additional targeted support within our more disadvantaged areas and our hard to reach communities. 
Um, so we, so my team have currently reevaluated the specification um, and are making some areas a little bit more specific and and possibly breaking it down into slightly smaller chunks to make it more attractive to some of our local organisations. Um, but we are really quite confident from conversations that we have had that we by doing making these amendments um, in in the short term we will receive um, a higher amount of um, bids who are who are happy to meet that specification. And um, I, and, sorry, sorry. Am I correct and, that this is the fund for ninety thousand pounds? Yes, that's right. So it's per annum. So this is so this yes, is it's not a fund; it's a contract for services. Um, so this is um, originally, well, currently, is held in a strategic grant by Dorset Community Action, um, and that will end at the end of this um, at the end of this month. So this is why my my team are working at pace to get something out um, to ensure these organisations are supported. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Can can I just ask you a quick question on that as well, just leading on from that? Um, I'm always interested in these that because the um, award of this grant hasn't been made yet, does that mean the whole grant is extended? Or what happens to if, if you see as an example, you've got money for a year, would it still be for a year, even though it's going to be several months late being um, awarded or will it be just shortened to the time that was allocated originally? Does that make sense? It does make sense, yes. Um, so the paper that I wrote to, to Cabinet that went through on the 6th of October 2020, um, Cabinet authorised um, a five-year um, contracts for these. But to keep it in line with the other half of the contract, we will um, make all the end dates the same. Um, okay. But we will utilise any money that we have had um, in savings, because obviously we have at the moment we mm -hmm. don't have a um, a, con a contract in place for the first of October, so there will be a small saving. But we will make sure we reinvest that to make sure there is additional training and support um, for organisations in the interim period. Um, so the the full budget will get used on on that to, to the support of organisations. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Kimber has come in asking a question. I'll ask my other questions in a minute. Yeah, uh, uh, th thank you, Joe, for uh, Good morning. Me in. Uh, and I'm sure like you, uh, we're really thankful for the, the amazing amount of assistance and help how the, all our communities pull together. Um, a couple of concerns is you're, you're saying there was some of the organisations, there's a bit of a delay in, in the grants and I'm just in, interested and uh, about that and the other thing is that uh, were we able to assist and I'm thinking many of the smaller community organizations that must have applied it must have been a mountain to climb and was we able to assist thank you so um Councillor Kim can I just ask for um slight clarification on mountain to climb well uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I was just thinking about the uh, the when, when you put a grant, the amount of paperwork that uh, you, you, and uh, backups that you have to deal with, and I'm just wondering uh, was able was everybody able to uh, deal with that side of it? Absolutely, yes. So um, yes, our our workload for grants has increased significantly during this period. Um, However, so through the Contain Outbreak Management Fund, um, I was able to secure a fixed term project support assistance specifically to assist with the Contain Outbreak Management Fund grants. Um, so by having an extra full time person in my team for a short period of time, um, we have been able to pro process these applications at speed. Um, and within our normal time frame, so we always have a four week turnaround um, for assessment. And um, for the first round of the Container Outbreak Management Fund, all organisations that were successful or not have been um, accepted and had their paperwork through and we're currently receiving invoices. So there has been no delay at all on, on that outside of our normal protocol, which I'm really, really pleased with. And um, I'm really, my team have really, really pulled together um, to make sure that there isn't because we do understand the importance of getting this funding out to our groups as, as quick as possible, because this is a time we want our organisations to restart. Um, and it's important they have the finances behind them to be able to do that. Okay, thank you for the reassurance. Thank you. OK, um, and my, my couple of questions. Um, one is probably quite an easy one to answer on 
where are we? 4.2, you talk about grants to youth clubs um, that used to be under, that were originally under Dorset County Council, um, which have gone independent. I'm just wondering, the first question is around whether all of those um, who were eligible for this actually applied and if they didn't, what, what measures were put in place to get in touch with them and tell them to apply for this funding? And my other question is probably going to be a bit harder to answer. And I'm, I'm aware that an awful lot of these grants are from government and they're very short, short time scale. Certainly the COVID ones need to get spent really, really quickly. I'm just wondering on how we're doing spending within specific timescales that we've got uh, for this. And the other thing that, that this does bring up is the resilience, because when we give money to organisations to get them up and going again, they often need a little bit of support going forward, may need further funding, but the funding has then gone. So how, how do we deal with organisations that we're supporting through funding and then we are withdrawing our funding? In some ways, these are both linked together because this is also with, to do with youth club funding as well. So I'd be really interested in the sort of resilience side of how we do this. Certainly, of course, Jill. And I'm actually going to answer the, the third question first, if that's OK. Um, and then um, Claire Shields has put into the uh, chat that she'd like to speak. So if I answer the um, how will we cope with further funding. So as part of um, the core budget for my team, we do have core grant funds that are funded from Dorset mm -hmm. Council, um, which I've spoken briefly about in number three, um, which is the Community yeah. and Culture Project Fund. Now, those funds were temporarily reallocated for COVID recovery. However, um, in the paper that I sent to Cabinet um, in October 2020, we also have long term um, funding for this. So any organisation wishing to apply for project funding, um, will be able to do so um, via that fund and those grants are up to £5,000 and we ha we open it twice a year and that's for culture culture and community. Um, in addition to that we also have the uh, we've created a fund called the Organisation Revenue Support Fund so this is a fund for community organisations for core costs so the um, the boring stuff, so things like the insurance, the rates, the electricity bill, the kind of core things that organizations need, need to have to be able to open their doors for a year and they can apply for between one and three years um, and we'll be opening that fund in January and inviting applications. The culture team um, also had this fund last year and they've allocated for a three-year program so it will just be the community that will be opening on that side this year. Um, so yes and I'll, I'll pass over to Claire now to answer the question um, about the youth activity if that's okay. Thank you Claire. Good, good morning, Claire. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Claire Hughes. I'm the Corporate Director for Commission and Quality and Partnerships for Children's Services. And, and my team has been working with Laura's team around the targeted youth funding. So um, not all of our um, former Dorset County Council youth groups did apply for the funding in the first round. Um, so we made direct contact and wrote to all of them that we were aware of, that we had contact details to let them know that it was up and running. And we've just closed um, the second round. So we're doing the analysis um, of that at the moment and there's a group of people working on um, who and what and how much that will be going. So we'll be able to give you a bit more detail on that um, after the round ends. Um, I think what I would say is our targeted youth workers have been working hard to build relationships in the community about which ones of those that are open and having conversations about saying the money's there if you need it. We know that some of our targeted youth groups and our, um, and our universal youth services have been accessing funding from other places as well. So some of it has come through some of the other council funding um, for little bits and projects and groups. So we'll try and pull that together, I think, and do a bit of an analysis at the end of the year, see what's left out of that funds and do a bit more targeting if that helps. OK, yes, that is, that's absolutely brilliant. Is there anybody else who would like to come in, please? I think I think that is it. So what, what we're being recommended at the moment is that members of, of PHSC consider the report um, to the, the voluntary sector during COVID-19 COVID and into recovery and note the relation to the organisational reset and planning VCS recovery. Are we happy with that as a recommendation committee? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. So we don't need to vote on that mm. because it's it's a recommendation. So we don't want to add anything. I don't think unless somebody comes in now. Okay. So thank you very much, committee. Um, and thank thank you very much, Laura and Claire, for helping us out on this. Uh, really appreciate it. And I love hearing about the voluntary stuff. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think Dorset Council does an absolutely cracking job of this and an awful lot of it goes underneath the radar. Um, residents are, are very quick to criticise councils and councillors, but what they don't realise is the amount of work that is done and the amount of help and support that is over there, out there, which is, is possibly uh, something that we all need to, to think about a little bit. So thank you very much. Um, Laura and Claire, if you'd like to stay for the rest of the meeting, please do. But otherwise, um, I'll see you again. I'll see you this afternoon, Laura. <laughs> OK, right. So moving on to the next item, which is the Safeguarding Children's Annual Report. Um, I think we've probably we've, we've got Anthony Douglas here because I've seen him coming in and out. And we've also got An Andrew Parry who is a portfolio holder for children's services, I think. Yes, he is. Um, Anthony, welcome to the meeting. Um, could I, I don't know who to go to first. Who would like to start this? I think probably an introduction from Andrew and then if Anthony, you'd like to come in and introduce your report, please. Uh, we've also got Teresa. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, my grateful thanks to the committee for looking at our annual report today in the areas of uh, safeguarding. This is, of course, a pan Dorset report, and I know Anthony will go on to speak about that in some detail. But when presented to Cabinet, there was clearly recognition of the uh, risks that are well documented to our children and young people, but also those emerging risks that we know will come as a result of the pandemic and variations in behaviours. We know that, for example, the county lines problems aren't, aren't static. They, they continue to emerge in different ways and, and uh, in doing so do create that additional risk to our children and young people. But the report does set out very clearly where we've sought to support them. Our grateful thanks to our partners across all organisations who work uh, tirelessly to do the best they can uh, in what has been the most extraordinary of circumstances on the backdrop, backdrop of the uh, pandemic. Um, and my grateful thanks, of course, to, uh, to Anthony. As I said at Cabinet, this will be the last time he will be presenting a report of this nature. Uh, he's served incredibly well as the chair of the Safeguarding Partnership, and uh, I wish him well for the future. Thank you very much. Could I pass over now to Anthony, please? So, sorry, Anthony, you're you're on mute at the moment. <laughs> this has got to be the saying of the pandemic, hasn't it? <laughs> you're, you're still on mute. You're still on mute. Can Chair, Chair, might I just, whilst Anthony is um, getting off mute, which I'm sure he will do any minute now, um, I it was, oh, I think that may have worked, Anthony. Is that OK now? That's yeah. it. Yes, thank you very uh, much. Yes, my, it wasn't my end, apologies. Uh, yes, well, Andrew's summarised this very well, and I'm about to hand over to James Vaughan, who's been, well, who still is your chief constable, but James is retiring on the 13th of October formally, and on that day he takes over from me. So I think I leave the work in very capable hands. Uh, just to emphasise what Andrew said about the lived experience during the pandemic, it's transformed everyone's lives. And it's impossible to generalise because some children, for example, who stayed at home with their foster carers or with their parents who were furloughed, felt much more secure as a result. But um, on the spectrum of lived experience, if you were trapped in experiencing domestic abuse um, with a, a perpetrator, then your life was potentially a really, really terrifying one. And the routes out weren't as straightforward because the public space was closed down. But I particularly emphasise the lack of sight on 
some children, even though agencies did their best to get them to school and to keep them under observation, inevitably there were fewer lines of sight to vulnerable children. And we certainly know that in terms of anxiety levels and mental health, as well as domestic abuse, the incidence levels went up considerably. And probably what we're seeing now come through as referrals is the tip of the iceberg. So we frequently hear um, the NHS is under pressure, but uh, I would say the whole public sector, as you've mentioned, the voluntary sector in your last um, item, they took a tremendous strain and they still do. But social care, schools, the police have all been working throughout. They're tired, um, often exhausted, and the pressures are rising. So that's the current context. This report is a retrospective one, it always is. It particularly relates to the year of the pandemic, 1st of April 2020 to the end of March 2021. And I suppose just two or three points I'll bring out because you won't want me to go on for um, too long. Uh, the first one is the enduring importance of multi-agency working. That survived the shift to hybrid working. Professionals found the use of teams convenient. They didn't have so much travel time. So the actual decision making during the pandemic probably got a little bit better. And but for families, it made access that much more difficult. So there were both advantages that happened in terms of protecting and supporting children and disadvantages. The some of the other themes to bring out were, I suppose, multi-agency working improved in a crisis. It often does. And some of the joint relationships were second to none. The test is always in quieter times to keep that level of intense multi-agency working going, although you may not think this is really a quieter time. And then the big shift in the partnership was the move towards place-based structures. Uh, the Pan Dorset structure covering BCP um, Dorset, we call them now the East and West footprints, are useful strategically, particularly where issues in common need to be addressed and particularly because of course health and the police still work Pan Dorset, although they've changed as a result of the councils wanting to do more in your own footprint. Health and the police have changed a little bit operationally to match that. So in the future, we'll be looking at the Pandorset Pan partnership as more of a strategic partnership focusing on issues like exploitation, um, suicide prevention that quite clearly cross boundaries. But most of the work will be done inside Dorset through the Strengthening Services Board and its associated quality assurance function. And I see that as a wholly positive move because it integrates safeguarding at every level into the way you're managing and scrutinising all children in Dorset. BCP have done the same, the structures are a little bit different, the governance arrangements are a little bit different, but I think in particular your Strengthening Services Board is chaired by your Chief Executive. It's run very ably, Teresa has a very prominent part and is driving it through professionally. And I've seen very high quality work there. So when it comes to next year's programme, the police will have done a little bit more on vulnerability because they know they need to after their recent inspection uh, by their own inspectorate. The CCG will have moved into the integrated care system, which in law asked them to do better partnership working with local government and other partners. That's still a battle to be won. And um, I see your strengthening services borders going from strength to strength. So it's difficult to be optimistic in such um, desperate work. But um, I'd be fairly optimistic that you've got a very strong grip of what is intrinsically work that's impossible to grip because it's unpredictable. Um, and it, the black swan effect is um, just about coming up now these days. It's a bit like climate change, it's coming up all the time. You can't really take anything for granted. Um, 
whether it's in families and assessments which have a limited shelf life or in what's going to happen tomorrow about particular aspects of service delivery. So I think the risks have gone up because of that, but um, I've been impressed by your work and that's the point at which I handed over, Chair. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, that's, it's been a really useful report and I have to say I found it a really interesting read as well. Um, I'm just wondering, has any any councillors got any comments to make? I haven't got any RTS in the chat bar at the moment. From from my perspective, the thing that I was really heartened by was the amount of multi-agency work that's going on. I think multi-agency work in a time like this when budgets are getting strapped, when people have got more and more to do, more and more is expected, unless we get really good solid multi-agency work on a lot of fields, we're not going to go anywhere. And I found your, your comments on online working were very interesting as well. Could, can I just ask, and this is probably sort of almost a rhetorical type question, you've got the, the, the balance of the pandemic boom, basically, that I think is, is the way it's been described in the papers, and also limited resources, and how we actually make sure that we don't drop any of the balls. When comes a time that we start, or is there any thought of a time that we might have to not stop taking referrals, but look carefully at our referrals as opposed to increasing the resources that we have? That I find sort of quite a difficult balance. Yes, just, um, well, those are both uh, incredibly contemporary and relevant points. With multi-agency working, I'd just say it's important for agencies to improve together, just as if they make cuts, they should cut together because it's hopeless if one agency cuts services, leaving others to pick up the tab. Mm -hmm. And for improvement, it's the same. That the good thing is that all agencies in Dorset need to improve. They do absolutely everywhere. But when I started, health and the police were a little bit more confident because they'd had good inspection reports. But what's happened recently with the CCG being criticised in the BCP send inspection and the police having been knowing they need a lot more to do about vulnerability, I think there's an opportunity to improve um, together. And then in terms of stopping referrals, my, my own advice would be that's quite a rocky road and quite dangerous. Lots of agencies are doing it. They call it business continuity. They stop doing all sorts of things. Um, but of course, inevitably, you pick up um, far less that way. And again, you leave others to pick up the tab, family members, friends, uh, communities. So it's a challenge, but I, I think agencies need to look at their operating models and adjust them as demand goes up. And you have to be obviously careful not to dumb them down into such a general service. Nobody gets any help. But I do think it's important to at least kick off every single inquiry and referral just in case. I was fairly horrified by lots of the superficial telephone triaging going on during the pandemic, particularly I'd say in mental health services, but not exclusively, where if you like people with an eating disorder, were sometimes rung and maybe every fortnight or so, but but asked some fairly superficial questions. They were on a waiting list, but um, I think the there's some lessons to learn about that, how not to triage and prioritise because it tends to be an administrative triage of a waiting list. Um, but it's a huge challenge. I'd probably put more staff into the front end of organisations more or less on permanent duty to just make sure that an, an initial look at situations can be guaranteed. But that's a matter for Theresa, a counterpart in BCP, um, the health trusts uh, and the police operationally. Luckily, when I semi-retired uh, a couple of years ago, I gave up that operational responsibility, which um, I must say, um, uh, I, I'm just constantly impressed and re-impressed by everybody who's doing it today because it's tougher today than it even was two years ago. 
I found that ab absolutely fascinating. I think, Teresa, you're asking to come in, and I noticed you nodding on some of that, which I was really pleased about. Can I bring you in now, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. And um, my my in real in sin uh, my real sincere and great thanks to Anthony. He has sailed us through some really choppy waters, and it's been really, really helpful to have you at the helm, Anthony. I can't say that strongly enough in terms of providing that leadership for that partnership, because there have been difficult times, exactly as Anthony's outlined. And I completely agree with the issue about um, having really professional, meaningful support at the front end of, of our work. And so in order to do that, you may well all remember that we we really invested in our children's advice and duty service so that when people are contacting our front door, unlike many other places where they have fantastic but business support people picking up the phone to begin with, we have the most um, experienced social workers doing that. It's been a challenge. It's always a challenge when we have um, people with um, gen gen genuine ill health and absenteeism to keep that strength in the front door, but that's a real commitment for us. And we've worked to strengthen that even further with an early help hub and now an advice and guidance line for SEND families and particularly for SENCOs in school too. So what we'll increase in, and, and obviously our multi-agency safeguarding hub, so our integrated front door will actually cover the whole range of need. And so families and professionals can pick up the phone and have a conversation. We know that isn't necessarily in line with what lots of people will talk about in terms of um, simplifying processes around having written um, emails, etc. But what we absolutely know is having those conversations with skilled professionals means that families are getting support more quickly in the right part of the system. Um, it's expensive, uh, we're, we are resourcing it already um, and we think it's worth it in terms of making sure that we have less system failure. But as Anthony says at this time, knowing what's coming through the door at the next minute, both mm -hmm. in terms of the Me Too and the Everyone Invited campaign, which we've also seen significant increase in, the um, hidden harm that is truer than ever in terms of domestic violence and abuse and violence against women and girls, and the genuine stress in families, which is seeing a significant increase in demand need, as, as you know, is my preferred word. Um, uh, it's, it's uncharted territory, but I'm confident we've got the right people in the right places to be able to respond to that for sure. Thank you ever so much a lot, Teresa. I'm, I'm really heartened by, by what you've just said. Um, I think we are on the right road, but it's, it's what comes through the door. We haven't got a clue until it does. And with them, the things like the Me Too, and, and to be quite honest, I, I hadn't actually thought about the impact of that on our safeguarding services. But of course, it's it's absolutely front and centre of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, could, could I go on to Councillor Rennie, please? And then I've got Councillor Kimber and Councillor Taylor. Thank you very much. And thank you, Anthony and Theresa, because it's very insightful this and um, and good recognition of how our partnership working has got better. And, and so important the words where you talked about uh, triage and put money in at the front mm. first. And this was what we did do uh, through the domestic abuse service as a council. We put money into our provider where they were able to do full 24-7 telephone inquiries with staff with the knowledge, not just a straightforward contact centre, which was really helpful. And I know they were grateful for us upping their commissioning. Um, the work has been amazing, but um, I would also like to say um, I would like us to be looking at these emerging risks that Andrew talked about and um, and so you may or may not know, I'm the uh, domestic abuse forum chair uh, and I sort of lead on these issues. And um, I think I'd like to see in the next report, and this will be up to James, and if, uh, if he wants to direct in this direction, some more notification about where we are with domestic abuse. Um, BCP, uh, to, in, in the Fuller report, BCP said they had significant, significant concerns. Uh, that was a bit tantalising for me. I wanted to know what their concerns were, but of course it's BCP and their business. Um, we said uh, we were seeing incidents of lower level DA incidents, increasing, indicating increase in family tensions. And I did talk about this in housing. For me, 
there is mm. no low level in domestic abuse. Low level is where it starts. And we talk about how much um, we are, Marrox and herders were looking at high risk. But if we're catching things earlier, which I think this partnership approach will do, we will be not only saving the trauma, but the costs of domestic abuse on a family, both emotionally and the cost to the to spend everywhere else. So I think it's important that we need to sort of be a bit more aware of this. Um, one of our other comments were um, many children and young people were living in situations of great risk um, and it gave some of the situations, you know, uh, but domestic abuse was not mentioned at all. Yet you have mentioned it, Anthony, in your roundup and I know that the board are very concerned about it. But um, I would just like to see a bit more relevance put around this. Uh, the front door is an amazing mm. thing. And um, one of the councillors, we are, you may or may not know, Anthony, some of our members of this committee, we are actually visiting the front door. Jill and I are going tomorrow. But one of our members went, a very experienced member and experienced in the area of health. And he said, he said in his email afterwards, how surprised he was at the number of children involved when there was a domestic abuse situation that was coming in through these calls. Um, so we're going to have a lot more trauma from this. So uh, I, it would be, I think the members who are here on this call would know I was going to mention something about this anyway. Um, I think I mentioned it to cabinet. We as a council have done a fabulous piece of work around the domestic abuse toolkit. We had a presentation at the forum the other day, and I think as more and more people have done the training and seen the presentations about the toolkit, they will be more comfortable in asking those questions. So maybe be able to pick things up earlier. Um, so I'm sort of giving a bit of a shout out for the team that put the toolkit together. And could we have some evidence in the next, in the following year of how that has worked and worked well? And one of the points you made, and ob for obvious reasons, we were not able to have 100% of first year visits within that first year after birth for families. And I think those children's worker, social workers, health workers, who are doing that first visit will be able to pick up so much more than they've been able to do during the lockdowns. Uh, I think it's been a really difficult year, but this pos this report is positive and great to take us forward. But I will be hoping and asking and looking for a bit more mention about domestic abuse next time. May I briefly respond? Yes, yes please do. I couldn't find the raise your hand facility on my screen. It seems to have gone. So um, anyway, but just to agree with all of um, what you've said and just maybe two or three points. I'll tell James to do it for next year. <laughs> <laughs> second, <laughs> um, second, we have done quite a bit this year on peer on peer abuse and that's quite important because I think it's a bit like child on parent abuse. It widens our understanding of what domestic abuse is in all of its forms. We know that it can be between, it's primarily um, men to women, can be women to men, can be children to parents, can be children to children. And then of course there's abuse outside the home. We used to think children could could blissfully ignore it. Um, but in the last 10 years, we've realized they know about it in about 95% at least of situations. And they're profoundly affected sometimes with lifetime consequences. So we've done some work this year on peer on peer and quite a lot in case reviews, but you're absolutely right. And um, one worry during the pandemic was if a new mother had not, neither seen a midwife nor a health visitor, during the times when just direct services were not happening, then 
you might certainly get to your first six months without seeing any professional. So I, I'm pleased that during the pandemic, services were restored, uh, not quite to their former level because some professionals still, um, like GPs, are not working enough face to face, although they're under tremendous resource pressures. But I'm just agreeing to everything you'll say, and I'll ask James to give the issues more prominence in next year's report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. And also thank you very much, Molly, for the questions. Um, as, as, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. If, if I can move on now to Councillor Kimber, please, could you ask your questions or come in? Then? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Jill. And if I can say thank you, Molly, Jill, Anthony and Theresa for uh, your report. Part of what you said, Anthony, uh, and I, I was wanting to sort of try and get to a bit more from it. The stresses and strains on our staff. Um, I know from my former profession that uh, that I, I used to get it firsthand, but uh, I just wondered if um, you, how you're feeling ab about the, this stress and strain to our staff. You know, it, it, for me, it, it, this possibly is a worry as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, and I think it's across the board. It's frontline staff, teachers, uh, social workers, early help workers, police, health professionals. It's always impossible to generalise because lots lots are incredibly resilient. But I would say certainly the experience has broken some people who were previously incredibly resilient. And therefore the emphasis on staff health and well-being has to be more prominent now than it was when the pandemic started. It's always been important, but of course it's a bit like harm in families. It's invisible. Not many professionals formally say or raise concerns about their own mental health. More are doing so. The public mood about that may help a little bit, but it's very difficult to admit you're not coping. And yet several are not even though they're still working full time and doing their best. And my worry is that a number of people I've spoken to feel anxious um, nearly all the time. I'd say it's an epidemic of mild anxiety and that's partly the nature of the work, but um, partly the, the lack of a let up. But also there's something that's happened over the last year that has just got to people and just made them feel less confident. And certainly the people that are receiving services will, will often say they're less confident than a year ago. And I think a lot of professionals feel that way, although they've done incredibly well. So if we think of um, referrals being the tip of the iceberg, they're going up, then probably health and wellbeing concerns will go up as pressures increase still further. There's no easy solution apart from putting it higher up the agenda as a concern. Is that OK, Paul? Yes, yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, okay. uh, th thank you, Chair. That's, uh, uh, it was as I expected. And um, if, if I can pay a tribute to all our staff, and I think uh, mm. uh, that would be, I, I think with, with your permission, I think I, I would put that forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, just a second before I bring you in, Councillor Taylor, could I just ask Councillor Parry, you have your hand up. Are you asking to come in at the end or would you like to come in during the debate? If I may just come in on the debate, it's in response to uh, the, yeah. the, the very valid points of, of Councillor Rennie, um, who, as we all know, is absolutely passionate on the subject of domestic abuse and finding ways of trying to, to deal with it. Um, and clearly in a safeguarding report of this nature, we will we will recognise things that, for example, the overwhelming percentage of children subject to any form of a child protection order will have seen an exposure, if not directly to themselves within their household, to some form of domestic abuse. Now, the challenge that we are going to have to see is, yes, we have a short term uh, aim, which is to isolate them from any harm and to find measures that will address any uh, obvious uh, and immediate uh, safety dangers that may be there. 
but I'm equally conscious that exposure at a young age to uh, behaviours of that nature could actually see us dealing with a longer term problem, which is today's victims become tomorrow's perpetrators. And therefore, we need to work with our localities through our locality teams to ensure that, you know, we, we, we keep a very, very close eye on the longer term behaviours of those people who have been victims of domestic abuse so that actually they are then becoming the advocates against domestic abuse, not the perpetrators of it, which is the point I'm trying to make. But that will take investment and I do appreciate that there's a conversation that we as a cabinet and the council will have to uh, have to ensure that happens. Spot on there. Um, can I just ask, uh, where are we? Councillor Taylor, would you like to come in, please? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you very much for this um, amazing report, I must say. Uh, we are addressing the problems across the county and the country, actually, uh, regarding uh, abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just always being concerned of the fact of joining up the dots. You know, where are we? Where are we with re respect of talking to each other about the information? Because as you know, I sit on the Fossil Selection Committee, Police Crime. It's the question of joining the dots up to, to say what's going on. Are we really understanding what's happening out there? That's my main question. Molly, you were spot on with the fact that the, the hidden dangers out there are forever there. And um, we just want to really investigate or can we look at joining up the services to communicate 100 percent so we know where we are? And that's the big question. Where are we? I'm very happy to respond, Chair, if, yep. if you'd like me if to. If you could, please. Yes, yeah, please. Thank you. thank you. And I think Theresa would like to as well. Yep. But just very quickly for me, it's been a problem for 50 years. It's why these bodies like Child Protection Partnerships, Safeguarding Partnerships came in, and it's still a problem. It's still unreliable. It's got a lot better. But mm. for example, over the summer, there were some incidents of um, domestic abuse, actually, that weren't notified quickly enough by the police to schools. Schools were off and that despite um, a huge investment in improving those notifications. They've got a lot, a lot better, but to the, the gold standard is really, as, as I think one of your colleagues said, even one act of abuse or neglect is one too many. So the gold standard is every day you have to make sure the right information gets to the right person at the right time and we've just got to get better and better about that. Theresa. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, thank you. And, and Councillor Taylor, as always, yeah, the, the, the key question. So what are we doing about that? We are approaching it from all, a range of different angles. The strategic conversations we're having are much richer, much improved. We are sharing those priorities together at a very senior level. We're also approaching it at an operational level. So if you think about things like our harbour project, the strength in that is the integration within teams. So the, the, the um, integrated police officers there is bringing a huge bonus to that harbour approach around young people and we want to see and do that more and more and the future that we see for children's services within Dorset is a multi-agency multi-professional network of people working around the family uh, with adult issues drugs and alcohol and domestic abuse and with the children's therapeutic needs issues and the safety issues there so we will be developing that more and more in the next few months but we're also taking a technological digital approach to that. So we're already reviewing our digital offer in terms of how and where we record our activity, how and where we communicate with our families. And there's a very particular project that will be coming forward to Cabinet in the near future around how we integrate further at a digital level. That, is, that isn't the Nirvana. We all know we've all chased that forever and that isn't the kind of, there's no silver bullets in this world. So we're approaching it in every single angle at an operational level and how we record our interactions with families and how we have those joint strategic leadership conversations as well. Because it is, as, as Anthony says, maybe some of us have been around this work for too long to know that actually it is the thing that will make the biggest difference. And so we are continuing to um, continuing to do that at every level. Thank you for like that. I just uh, emphasising my point as if to say as a councillor and uh, <clears throat> 82 of us in the, in the county, this information, could it be kind of 
brought into our notice as councillors because we don't hear this. You know, I, I can see reports, but we don't hear what is going on so we can actually interact with our um, people who have elected us. You know, there, there is stuff out there which I pick up every day and thinking, well, OK, and uh, it doesn't seem to be noticed. That's why I'm trying to work out we're walk, we, we are now working outside the council boundary of in the council house and going towards the people to say we're here to help. How can we achieve that message? That's where I want to be. And of course, your individual residents, your individual constituents can can reach out to you for that help. And I know that they do in many, many cases and in yeah. many, many circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we're always incredibly grateful for the support you give them. You know, however, the very delicate, appropriately delicate line we tread around personal information, around all of those GDPR issues and around making sure that families who choose to keep things private can do so. So we tread that careful path. Um, but I know that the important message that will come to your constituents is if we as a council talk about being a caring, inclusive council at every level. And if you as members are, are part of that, that will mean they will come to you when they need that support and, and that support you can provide at a very local level. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're achieving something today and uh, the report is excellent, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Taylor. Could I go to Councillor Dunseith now, please? Thank you, Chair. My um, <clears throat> my comment or comment, I think, was about um, paragraph two and the future funding of this partnership. It does state that the strategic intention is to move to equal co contributions. And I note that the police contribution is significantly lower than the other contributions. And it's probably a good idea to have James Vaughan in on the partnership. But what would happen if the police said, we don't have the money? We can't give you any more. Thank you, Anthony. Well, in short, you couldn't do anything about it. it it's although yeah. it's an aspiration and it's set out in guide, government guidance, it's not a legal mandate. And um, so it, it's purely a matter of influencing and persuading. Mm -hmm. But I think there, there is a piece of work to do. The partnership is not brilliantly resourced compared mm. to many others doesn't have for example professional advisors it has business managers so there's a limit to what it can do um, and that's partly why i felt the move to place based was so positive because the partnership wasn't adequately resourcing the dorset work nor the bcp work yeah. um, enough but it's a it's a question probably of if you're 82 councillors then of influencing and persuading Scott Chilton, the new chief constable, um, putting pressure on James, but also it's not so much applying pressure. I think the police need their partners as much as their partners need them. So I'd say there's a moral imperative to share the cost because the, there's an equal benefit to be realised, but they're one of the lowest in the country at the moment. And yes. it may well be what normally happens is there's a tiered approach perhaps over a couple of years, but you know, I'd be very happy to give um, James information on those local authorities like Essex and Suffolk who have got equal funding and to see why they do that. And of course, in those areas where they do fund equally, often the police and crime commissioner would like it to be less. And so they look to areas like Dorset to say, well, we don't really need to spend that much, do we? So this is always the problem where you don't have a national um, guideline of any force. But I think the short answer is I'd suggest maybe over two years to try to persuade Scott Chilton of levelling up. Thank you, because of course, with all, all the, the excellent work that you do, without funding, it really cuts up the foundations. Indeed. Thank you so much, Anthony. OK, thank you very much. I don't think we've got 
Um, any more questions? I've got a question from Councillor Pipe. I don't think we have got James Vaughan in on the meeting this morning. No, have we got he's, someone just... he's definitely not here. OK, thank you very much. Um, do you have any questions, Councillor Pipe? Just check in. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, had James been here, I would have uh, asked him what his priorities are going going forward once he takes over the, the, the job next next month. I it is next month, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Uh, but as he's not, I can't and I won't. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you very much, Councillor Pike. Um, I think that's the end of the questions. And I think it's been an, an absolutely really good, stonkingly good paper. Um, quite worrying in, in parts, but overall mm. really good. Um, I think Councillor Parry, you wanted to come back in, did you? Thank you, Chairman. Just in response yeah. to the point that uh, Councillor Dunseat had raised, where of course in the area of political relationships, we have made it a priority to uh, establish very early on with the new uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, David Sidwick, a positive working relationship and to highlight him the areas where we do feel there is a uh, need for challenge debate and, and, and sensible ways of working and meeting our obligations. Um, but I'm very conscious that where we have the urban authority, if I can put it in those terms of BCP versus the rural semi rural authority of Dorset Council, um, we need to ensure that we are a, a, a very a loud voice in the room when those discussions are taking place, because of course we do want to see our fair share uh, if we are going to be funded on equal uh, basis, but our fair share of resource coming our way as well from our partners in meeting the needs of our children and young people. OK, thank, thank you very much for those comments. And yes, I, I totally agree. Um, OK, I'm going to wind, wind this debate up now. Um, this paper has already been to Cabinet and it's come to us to have a look at and debate and see if there's anything we want to take further. I haven't heard anything this morning that we want to take further forward. I think, Anthony, you've made a couple of notes to pass on to James in his new role, um, but I think we haven't got any recommendations to take forward on this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, will do, I will do that. OK. Um, can I just thank you very much for the paper and can I also thank you for all the work that you've done for us over the years. I think what has really struck me over the time is the working relationships that you've got with our officers and you've obviously got with all the other organisations that are absolutely invaluable. So thank you very much for your work over the years that you've been with us and I hope you have a happy retirement. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure good. you'll um, find something else to do. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, Goodbye. thank you. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. Well done. <laughs> I don't know who said well done, but I totally agree. Um, can we go on to the next item now, which is the Dorset Children Thrive item, which is agenda item seven on the agenda. Um, if I can hand over, I think initially, who's doing the presentation on this? Sorry, you're being, you're being Claire Shields capable hands, Councillor Taylor and, and Claire's, Claire's written this report, which is clearly a, a summary and a summation of our new model around children's services. It's early days, but there's some helpful kind of early indications in there around what was called blueprint for change and now is called Dorset Children Thrive because that's our ambition for all of our children. Um, but I'll leave you with with Claire, if I may. OK, th thank you very much. If you'd like to introduce the paper, Claire, that would be really useful. Thank you. Um, thanks, Councillor Taylor, and thanks, Teresa. Yeah, we're one year on. It was our one year anniversary of our new operating model for children's services, um, Dorset Children Thrive, on the 1st of September. So a really helpful time to come back and reflect on where we've been and how far we've come, really. Um, I think um, it's important to note that we didn't embark on a big change programme in children's services lightly. Um, for many reasons, um, we heard from our partners, we heard from our children and families and we heard from our professionals and those people working with us that some of those issues you were talking about um, earlier around how we work together um, weren't quite right um, and some of that was in the way that our services were structured. So we thought really long and hard on the best evidence 
what we knew worked to be able to think through how do we design children's services that are more agile and flexible and able to be fit to meet the needs of our families that they've changed over the years. Um, so a big program of change, a big reorganisation, both of the way that our services are structured and how our staff deliver, but also thinking through the culture of how we work in children's services and making sure that we're able to put children and families at the heart of everything we do. So lots of hard work um, to get us over the line. Um, and we did, and we did that through COVID. Um, we managed our staff um, through that big change process. And we did it on time um, and we got it up and running and going. So no mean feat and, and our thanks really to our staff for sticking with us and helping us shape up what that would look like as we go forward. Um, we've talked a lot about the detail of the model in Appendix 1, so I'm not going to take you through that. Teresa already talked about the importance of our front door and making sure that we get the right services to our families. The thing we were trying to achieve is probably a little bit um, of what Councillor Taylor was talking about. How can we join up? How do we know what's happening with our communities and how do we wrap around our families with everything we need? So the majority of our services are delivered in localities and we've got some small special specialist services that then reach across where we need some specialist expertise or economies of scale to be able to deliver that um, in the best way possible. Um, some of the things that we wanted to focus on were improving our governance. So Anthony talked through really some of the partnership governance and the improvements that we've made there. You have already seen in this committee our new children and young people and families plan. And you can see that we've now got much greater engagement from our partners and we've got really strong senior leadership buy in. So our children, and young people and families plan um, chaired and um, led by the deputy leader of the council with all partners there, our strengthening services board chaired by the chief executive. And you've got um, lots of reports from us through here from scrutiny. So in terms of governance, we are in a much better place than we were previously and have put a lot of time and effort into thinking through how that works for us. Leadership and accountability was one of the things we were really focused on, making sure that we can get that right. And we know working in locality bases can make that a little bit more difficult. So we thought quite long and hard and documented quite clearly how our leadership and management arrangements works. But you'll also see in Appendix 1, we thought really hard about how we make decisions for our individual children and young people um, and how we make sure that there's good line of sight and accountability um, through that as well. Um, Lots of panels, appropriate meetings, but the most important thing that I wanted to draw your attention to is how we undertake our supervision of our frontline practice. And you can see that that and the timeliness of that has improved quite significantly. And that's really important because it makes sure that our plans for our children are progressing well. And then having a principal social worker there leading practice puts us more in line with good and outstanding authority so that we can make sure that we're doing the right thing for our families. We've talked a little bit about our staff already um, in the previous report. One of the challenges that we had um, when we embarked on this was making sure we had the right level of um, social workers in the right places. And we've seen huge improvement in that. Our recruitment and retention is strong in Dorset. And when social workers join us, they join us because they like our model of delivery. So they tell us that our Dorset Children Thrive model is really attractive to them. The impact of that, um, which is why it's most important, is that we've seen a reduction in average caseloads for our social workers. And that means we've been able to create the space for really good direct work. And that's why we want to reduce those caseloads. So you can see one of the case studies, the impact of our social workers having time um, to be able to do that direct work. It's really, really important to us. Employee engagement um, was a challenge for us before we embarked on this. And we really wanted to think through how can we make sure that all of our workforce feels involved and understands the priorities of children's services. And we've seen big improvement there. Um, participation in surveys um, and children's services was historically low. That's much improved. And the number of children uh, of our workers saying that Dorset is a good place to work has also improved massively and they would re recommend it to other people. Um, they've told us, our staff, through some engagement, that they're feel much better equipped to be able to work together. And we know that's the thing we were trying to achieve. And the communication has improved as well. Um, 
Teresa talked about um, our early help hub and making sure that we get it right um, at the front door, making sure that we're working with families at the right levels. We spent a lot of time focusing on that. Um, and I know that some of you will have already seen the early help hub and some more of you are visiting to be able to see how the front door works in practice, how we make sure that we're getting things right. We've seen a big increase in families supported through early help, a reduction of those receiving social work interventions, which is what we wanted to achieve. We want to be able to balance that out and get it in the right way. We've seen a reduction in the um, rates of children in our care, and that's both about helping children to return home, but about reducing the number of entrants coming in. Really effective work through the harbour model. Still work to do on child protection and making sure that we get that at the right level, and we play really, really close attention to that to make sure that we're doing that well. Our focus on performance and quality assurance has massively improved. You'll have seen in the benchmarking report We've got um, really steadily improving key performance indicators across a range of our performance areas and um, created a huge amount of opportunities for, for performance to be discussed and owned by the people delivering services. So they have huge access to um, key performance indicators, management information and reports to be able to understand how they're doing and how they're achieving and they respond quite quickly. Um, but more than that, um, we're also focused on quality assurance. So you can see the quality of our audits is showing that practice is improving. We've got a high quality learning and development offer that sits alongside that. And we really work with our frontline practitioners now to think through how can they talk more ably about the impact that they're having on children and families. And that's a piece of work that we're still working with them on. Capacity for brokerage was an important area of investment for us. We wanted to free up our frontline practitioners to be able to do the direct work they needed to do, um, but also to be able to think through, do we know what our providers are doing? Do we know what that looks like um, on a daily basis? And how can we make sure that we get greater value for money and improve quality? Um, that works. Um, working well we're seeing the impact of that and we're also we're being able to build relationships with providers so that they can offer more of what we want and some of that has resulted in some new residential children's home provision in the county not run by us so just having some better relationships with providers to be able to move them forward for what we want to achieve and then finally in the report we just wanted to show you how it's working in practice um, and some examples of pulling that through you can see that we're really focused on putting children and families at the heart of what we do, getting some of the feedback so that we know that we're doing that well. A very big and strong focus on multidisciplinary working, so making sure we wrap around and we're able to do um, what we need to do from all of those disciplines. And that we're working in partnership with our children and families as professionals, but also within communities. So a real strong example of how our local alliance groups and local communities are coming together to think through how do we make best use of the collective resources that we have to meet the needs of individual communities. Um, so a whistle stop tour really um, of um, the paper. Quite happy to take questions if that helps. OK, th thank you very much, Claire. That that was really useful. Can, can I just ask? Um, First of all, before we go into the di discussion, could you talk us through Appendix 2 a little bit more? Because I, I wasn't sure where that had come from, because that's not our performance management, our in-house, is it? And I was just wondering when the 2021 will be available. So if, if you could just talk us through that, that table a bit, because I, I found that a little confusing. I don't know whether other members did. What we were trying to um, show Councillor Taylor was distance travelled on some of those key mechanisms, uh, those key performance indicators that tell us how the system of is working. So that's Sorry, could, could I just interrupt? Can we go down to um, Kerry? Can we go down to page 51, please? On the agenda, if if you're there at the moment. OK, I'll, I'll uh, leave. Uh, um, so the data has absolutely been produced by our corporate performance team, um, Councillor Taylor, so it's a piece of work that they've done for us, but we wanted to be able to think through a bit of benchmarking so that we could see how we're performing against um, neighbours, so good and outstanding local authorities and statistical neighbours, um, but also how we've um, performed um, across the system. So some of the um, key performance indicators, if we can just wait until we get the paper up, I'll show you, I'll be able to talk you through them. 
flipped it on, just bear with me a sec. Oh, so, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so um, some of this is about activity data, so numbers and ch of children or young people and the rate um, per 10,000. So if you look at the left hand bar, so you've got referrals and assessments completed and the little dots um, are about where we were in points in time and how other people are doing as well. So you're looking for the green dots and then you're looking against um, the orange dots tell you how we're doing nationally. Um, and the green dots tell us how we were before and after. So in 1920 is the darker green and then the paler lime green is Dorset in 2021. So what you can see across this is that um, referrals and assessments in social work have um, reduced and that is really helpful for us because we want to make sure we're providing early help as well. And we want to make sure that our social workers are working with the right families. Um, you can see changes in children in care, for example, as I discussed, that that has gone down and much more in line with national and local authorities um, that are good and outstanding, which is really helpful for us thinking through how are we performing across the system. Timeliness around child protection is still something that we need to work on. It has massively improved, um, was one of our areas of um, challenge before, which is that middle part of the graph there. And then the children in care and care leavers, that focuses really on placement stability and making sure that our children are in um, good homes for as long as possible. So you can see the improvement there, a reduction in children with three or more placements and an increase in children in care that have been placement for two or more years. And then you can see a reduction in children in, um, in care leavers or in, in improvement sorry, in care leavers that are in education, employment or training. If you move down a little bit just around effectiveness there, if you could just move that graph down a tiny bit. Thank you. You can see the child protection numbers. Um, we have got more um, child protection, um, fewer child protection cases that are open for a longer period of time, which means we're working and moving those plans through. Does that make sense? I don't know, Trace, if you want to add anything um, to that as well. Yeah, thank you, Claire. Uh, I think what we were wanting to show, which sometimes our performance data doesn't show in such a, a quick capture on one page, is the progress made during this time. Mm -hmm. really. And I think, you know, what, what we would really like to be able to do, but I think the previous conversation highlights how difficult that is, is how we could show that actually if you could run a pandemic line across this, just how much great progress staff have made in this incredible time is, is quite remarkable. Um, so, so we look for progress. We absolutely track that. We're a strengths based organisation and we want to celebrate where people have made great effort and had good impact and then we absolutely look at what's not working well and where we need to put our conspicuous attention into that so this is um this is made in house uh, the the fabulous Chloe Greer and team have been producing some incredible benchmarking and um, and dashboards for us, and that really allows us to focus at a really crystal clear element of where we need to pay attention to our performance. I, th I thought this this was really interesting, and certainly the first line on the comments um, where you're talking about um, Dorset are within the range of good and outstanding authority performance in in from 1920 on the majority 11 out of 14 of these measures i think that is excellent and i think right the way through this morning's meeting what we've been talking about is continuous improvement which as somebody who was involved in quality in, in my previous life i just it's it's music to my heart to be quite honest that we're not just sitting there we are looking forward and we 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 are moving forward and we don't have this sort of blame culture that some organisations have that can be so destructive to the organisation. Um, right, I've got two people asking to speak at the moment and then I've got a few questions myself to come in. Um, Councillor Pipe, would you like to come in, please? Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> I'd, I'd just like to say to Claire, actually, um, uh, going back to uh, county days where Claire was involved, um, as was I as, as a corporate parent and, and on the uh, related scrutiny board, uh, how things have greatly improved over, over the last uh, couple of years uh, in, in, in particular, particularly in the, in, the, in the way that we look after our, um, our, our corporate charges as it were and and it is it's, it's always good to see that the the numbers are actually going down uh whether that's a reflection on uh, uh domestic uh 
circumstances, whether, whether as far as the children are concerned or whether it's because uh, uh, the daughter council are, are doing a, a, a much, much better job. And I would just like to say to Claire and all of her team, you know, have, having having been involved over the last sort of seven, seven years or so uh, uh, with, with this, that I, I think they're doing an excellent job under excellent leadership and with a with a portfolio holder who, who for once knows what the what he's talking about and that that goes to everybody thank you very much thank you thank you councillor pipe um could i go to councillor took please thank you chair um I think this is an excellent report and it's wonderful to see how things have, have, have improved. Um, it's not been going long, as I understand it, uh, and it might be a bit early, but with any sort of change in management and organisation of, of this quality, quantity of, of this size, there will be problems that are thrown up. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if we're starting to get a handle on what the changes may have, what what issues there may be that we can we can build further improvements around. Have we any any uh, clearly any scrutiny uh, would would need to look at not only how good things are and and, and they do look very good, but also what the uh, the little sneaky things in the background that might be coming along to bite us later might be. Do we have any idea what those might be? We've um, we've been doing quite a lot of work and and listening to our people to see whether we where where we are, what we need to change, and and how things have been working along the way. So we've done a little bit of that already. So um, some of the ways we were supporting our children in care, we hadn't got quite right. So we need to do a piece of work around that. Um, some of the way that we were providing our education, health and care assessments wasn't quite right, and we needed to do a little bit of work and a bit of tweak um, around that. And some of the ways we were doing um, our business support weren't quite right, so we needed to tweak that as well. So I think. Um, with improved communication and um, improved involvement, our staff were picking them up and we're hearing them as we go. I think um, we were always very clear that this was the starting point um, of what we wanted to achieve going forward. And Teresa already talked a little bit about how we make sure that we're doing whole family working um, as well as we can do and how we make sure that we get it right for our early years and our little babies. So I think those are the two pieces of work that we'll be wanting to bring forward um, and making sure that we do that um, as well as we can. So a really solid foundation for us, strong principles and rules around early health, whole family working and what we need to achieve and the importance of place and localities, some tweaks along the way and then a bit of um, thinking through how do we make sure that we do whole family working as well as we can. Are we getting the child protection system just right as we want it to be? I think some thinking for us to do there as well. So I don't know, Trees, if you wanted to add anything else. Thank you, Claire, and, and, and thank you, Councillor Took, for your great question and uh, Councillor Pipe for your, you know, your really lovely feedback. It's so important for the teams who have worked so hard. You know, you all know that, but people at the front line and their managers have worked so hard over the last 18 months. I am so impressed by their ability to get this performance where it needs to be. But absolutely, we've got more to do. Um, we, we have a huge ambition for the children of Dorset. When we say we want every child to thrive, we're not saying that lightly. We want to see every child having the very best life outcomes. And at the moment, we've still far, got far too little provision around foster care. So my background is there. Let's do this. Claire's background is there. We want more foster care so our children stay home. They stay local where they can't stay in their families. But my first position is I want our children in their families and in their communities. And we've got to do ever more, ever more for that. And I know that you as, a, as an experienced committee really understand that to do that, we have to hold more risk as an authority. You know, families will have difficult times. Children will live in difficult circumstances and we hold that risk and we must do that in a really managed, structured way. And we must do that every day with every worker. And of course, our staff are fabulous, but people have a bad day or we might get a gap in a particular team or we might get some new staff who need training and learning. So spinning the plates across our county of making sure that we are consistently delivering the best performance everywhere remains what gets us out of bed, 
but also what probably you know causes us a few sleepless nights sometimes in terms of making sure that is consistent in a time of pandemic working that has made it so difficult to be with our people where we needed to be. So this isn't, um, I really wouldn't want to say that in any way we're thinking, right, well, that's it, we're home and dry, we're, we're job done. We don't feel that at all, not least because we have a huge ambition for our children that we share with you, we know that, but also because it's a really difficult time we've come through and we've got more to do. And the, the areas Claire's outlined, the right ones, our tiny babies are the most vulnerable. It sounds like the bleeding obvious, and you know I'll always kind of say that we need to pay attention to the bleeding obvious, but they are our most vulnerable. And in this time, they have sometimes not had the support they needed. So we want to wrap around those children. We have a plan for the next generation. Our strategic alliance is chaired by Councillor Wharf brilliantly. It is a fabulously attended strategic alliance board across the partnership. And our focus around the best start in life, a good education for all, young and thriving, those remain. But we want now every child that's born in Dorset to have a good life outcome to thrive in the next 10 years. So we are um, very pleased to be welcoming Ofsted today to undertake a three week inspection into our services from today. Just had the call at nine o'clock this morning. That's part of our journey to make sure and to give us assurance and that will be helpful that Scrutiny will have that report in the coming months. That will be important to us, but equally as important is what our families tell us what our staff tell us and what our children's life outcomes tell us as we carry on on our ambitious journey to make sure that all of our children have those good lives. Thank you. Thank, thank I, you. I, I think that, that thank was you. really good. That was excellent. <laughs> um, I, I was particularly struck by uh, part of Claire's answer uh, where she actually identified things that had been tweaked and needed to be tweaked. And I, this idea that this is an iterative growing process is, is, is important, I think, and I'm, I'm very, very pleased to hear that the offices also had it in that light. Um, and it, it, it's so far it's brilliant. Long may it continue and I look forward to it to, to it getting even better. Thank you. I, I appreciate I've, I've got you, Councillor Parry, waiting. Are you OK if I call you in as, as the last speaker? Very, very happy to, Chair. OK, thank you. Can I go to Councillor Taylor now, please? Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to emphasise everything that's just been said before. It's amazing. It's huge work, huge work, and it's outstanding. And I'm just so pleased at long last we are actually listening to what's actually going out in our communities. But to emphasise, as I said earlier, across the board, you know, we need to speak about this with all of our relevant uh, social bodies out there to making sure we all understand the message to help our community. And I emphasise that so I've just been reading page 26 of the report. At the end, it says, as a partnership, Dorset Priorities coming together to focus on recovery by paying close attention to equality, inequality, sorry, and having strong ambition for all children and young people to thrive. I can't say anything more. You know, that, that, those are the words that mean, yeah. yeah hit the heart, don't they? Hey, we really yeah. do. Thank you. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you very much. I've, I've got a couple of questions I would like to ask. Um, you've talked quite a lot about staffing and I think it's been very difficult. It's been def difficult for all of us, not only officers, for councillors, for everybody else in this last year, trying to work in a virtual world where um, informal communications are, are really almost impossible, to be quite honest. It's to me, the thing I miss is the bits that you pick up in the office, just chatting to people. You've, you've had a, a huge amount of recruitment during this year and people changing jobs. I'm just wondering how that has worked within a virtual world. And I'm thinking particularly, you know, when, when you get new people in, how do you actually integrate them to a team where you've got managers, et cetera, that may not have even yet had the opportunity to meet their staff face to face? It's um, it's been a it's been an interesting time, I think, for people to join <laughs> us. Um, is um, uh, is the feedback, and we've learned and got a little bit better at this actually as we've gone along. So, um, most new starters will have a face to face meeting with their manager in the day that they arrive. So somebody will go oh, meet good. them and they'll have a conversation, and then it's not just fully remote. Um, and we've had some opportunities for outdoor meetings and people getting together. And of course, some of our workforce has been um working out of 
of officers where they needed to um, as well, just in terms of some of those teams. We've made some of that um, opportunity available. I think our staff have been absolutely amazing at things like virtual coffee mornings, virtual drop in sessions, inductions, meet your team, um, as well as doing some of that face to face stuff. So they've been really creative. Um, but yeah, it's different. It's definitely different and it's required a lot more thought. Um, we're really looking forward to this week. We've got our first face to face children's services induction meeting um, where people are coming together to do that virtually um, and safely. And I think um, the feedback that we've had is that people are really, really looking forward to doing more of that um, as time comes along. But what has been really beneficial through the digital has been able to access training really quickly and get up to speed and get to know people um, really quickly and be able to see policies and procedures as well. So there's been some benefits to being online mm. as well. And um, the speed by which people have been able to introduce themselves and get to know people has been quite interesting. So, yeah, we've got definitely got better at it as time has moved on. Mm. I think it's interesting. I never thought in this world that I'd ever have meetings with council officers on a park bench. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's, there's a whole new world out there, isn't there? Um, I've got another question to ask as well on uh, oh, G, little G, which is, is around targets. And I always wonder in these sort of papers how we set targets, what targets we're aiming for, because we're, we're talking of, um, I can't think what it was, um, Audits in social work um, was just over 50% earlier this year and it's now 77%. I just wonder um, how we set targets and what targets we should be setting. Because, you know, in an ideal world, I like 100%, but that's never going to be achievable. So what target are we aiming at? And um, our targets vary depending on the area of work that we're looking at. So we, we um, set our targets in a number of different ways. So we will look at um, the key performance indicators of good and outstanding local authority areas and how they're achieving. Um, and we'll compare ourselves also with um, the region or with statistical neighbours and we'll think through what does that look like. But we'll also take into account of where we've come from and making sure that it's achievable for our staff. So we may set a target and then stretch it. So um, in we'll say we want to get here first, once we get there we'll stretch it and even better if. So we do a little bit of that as well. So it depends on the area that we're looking at, but it's very much about benchmarking against what's good and outstanding elsewhere and then setting that target and goal as we go along. OK, that, that is lovely. Thank you very much. Could I bring in Councillor Parry now as, as I think probably the last speaker? Please. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to, to discuss and bring this report to committee. Um, I would just like to start in the area of children in our care and, and the wonderful work of our corporate parenting board and overseeing that. So we've also very much got ourselves into the headspace of that we should have the right child in care at the right time and that we want to see every child in our care in a settled homely environment wherever possible because ultimately we know that every time there is a placement breakdown that can only compound the problems that child will face going forward and we want to minimize those opportunities we want to minimize that when it occurs um in respect of uh, the visits from Ofsted. When I when I first came into post in the, the very last days of the, the, the former Dorset County Council, I'm very conscious that at, at that time there seemed to be a culture of fear of an Ofsted inspector. And my challenge was I wanted us to create an environment where we welcomed inspection. We wanted to show off our local authority and want to show off children's services and what we do for the children of Dorset. And I very sincerely hope we will see evidence of that. Uh, in the course of this Ofsted inspection. We want to welcome them to our, our, our offices and our, our wonderful county. <laughs> Turning to what we, we're looking to achieve, well, I've set out very clearly that I think everything we should do should always be good to outstanding, and I've challenged officers time and again about this, and they've challenged me as well, to be fair. Um, it, is, it is a matter of pride for us that we should deliver good to outstanding services for the children and young people of Dorset. And, uh, I'm very mindful that uh, they hold us to account and that when we have those workshops with children and young people, gosh, some of the most challenging questions that are thrown at us do come from them and quite rightly so. Turning to the whole area of blueprint to change, blueprint for change, um, it was a well thought out uh, process delivered at pace. The only thing that I probably hadn't factored in 
was of course we'd be doing that against the backdrop of a pandemic. But nevertheless, we 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 hit the, the go button on it and it did commence a year ago. Gosh, that seems like a blink of an eye, but it was a year ago now. And it was always going to be a case of plan, do, review and adjust. So it was a plan, we did do it. We have reviewed it and we are making adjustments. And, and the point that um, Councillor Took um, raised there, just for one little example I can give you, which is in the virtual school, which is led by the, the very brilliant Lisa Lynn Scott, who's done some incredible work there and got a really well motivated team. But we've recognised after a period of time in, in role that we need to move Lisa into that space where she can be more strategic and that, that there is an officer capacity beneath that to be operational. And that's a one little adjustment that we can do internally and, and uh, make that work that little bit more efficiently in that area of our service. So that's something that I think matters enormously. In respect of new officers that have joined us and officers that have left us during the course of the year, um, yes, we, we thank the officers that have left us. Uh, some have taken a well-deserved retirement after many years service to the local authority and we wish them well. But in welcoming new officers, um, and I say this with the, the riest of smiles, um, I, I did have a little moment, I won't embarrass the officer concerned, where I'd spoken to them a number of times uh, in, on a virtual meeting of this nature. And when I met them in person at an event we held at St. Mary, I realised they were probably about a foot shorter than I thought they were on the uh, the video call so and they took that in good spirit and I I wouldn't I never asked them what they thought of me but there we go um, so we do get a different perception when we see people online to how we are when we are all in the room but I do hope that we will have that and I do understand the point that was made about that little chat in the coffee coffee room you know when we were purchasing St Mary's um, and I, I know uh, um, chairman you were very kind enough uh, to give up some time to come up and see the premises uh, ahead of any uh, decision to purchase. Um, but it was so nice to be able to talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis informally as we went around the site and the benefit that we both got from having that meeting. And I know that all 82 members will want to, when we can move into that space of having a safe environment uh, of those collective conversations that we have, because I know a lot of good work is done in those areas. Could I thank all members of council? for the huge support they have given to children's services is since we became Dorset Council. And when we look back over the last couple of years, we have achieved an enormous amount of work in a very short period of time. And I do appreciate that it would not have been possible if not for time and time again, you have given your backing to our plans. So thank you one and all. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Perry. And I, I must say, I very much echo your sentiments there. Um, if we can go back to the recommendation, which is that scrutiny committee consider the implementation of the new Dorset Children Thrive model and the impact on quality and performance. I think we've had a really good, really detailed discussion on this this morning. I find it really interesting that you've got Ofsted coming in, which and that you're looking forward to it because in my role, my previous role in quality, I always look forward to audit coming in, uh, auditors coming in, because that's where you find out where, what other people think of you and where you can improve. And they always find something. You can guarantee they will find something. But um, I really look forward. I take it the audit report, the Ofsted report, will either go to audit or will it come to here? I would hope it comes to our committee. It'll come to scrutiny um, yeah, following Cabinet and it, it may go to audit to uh, Councillor Taylor. And um, and we are looking forward to it. We do welcome the opportunity. I, I genuinely believe that inspection is an, a crucial right for the people of our communities to know what's happening for, for them and with them. Um, and we also know that it's, as you say, it's an opportunity for us really to reflect. It's going to be very busy. It's going to be very demanding upon us. So I, I'm going to, first of all, um, beg permission to uh, to depart this meeting in a little while if I go off and begin to get everything <laughs> ready with the team that we need to do. But um, and I would just also beg forgiveness if in the next three weeks you find us a little bit slower than you might do for other matters. Uh, please just know that we're going to be very, very busy. But it's just been very, very important to feel the support of this scrutiny cabinet this morning. That, um, uh, sorry, scrutiny cabinet, listen to me. The scrutiny committee. We will um, we'll be a cabinet, we don't <laughs> mind. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, to really take us into that as as it will be a, as I say it'll be a it'll be a job of work but we'll do that to make sure that we can display um, everything that people have been doing so thank you very much okay Th thank you very much and um, if, if you yes of course you can say that 
she's saying, please, can I leave the room now? I <laughs> I was well impressed when she said we had a phone call this morning at nine o'clock and she is at this meeting smiling, looking calm and not looking <laughs> like when you talk about the swans gliding on the top and the feet underneath. Uh, so good luck to both her and Claire and the rest of the team. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Renning. With you, we know that you're with us on our shoulders, which is helpful. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you very much, everybody. Um, if we can move on to the next item now, and please please feel free to leave if if you need to. I think Theresa's already hit the leave button. Um, the next item on our agenda is the performance scrutiny. Now we had a meeting, a, a pre-meet on this about a week ago where David Bonner took the time to walk us through this again. This is a huge piece of work that he's been involved in, um, looking at how we performance monitor the council, which is no small feat. And we have pre-meets on this because of the sheer volume of information that we're being given. And it was extremely helpful. Um, if I don't quite know how to play this, uh, David, I see you're online. Would you like to present or would you be quite happy to go into questions? It's entirely your call. So good morning, committee. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thanks, Chair. So um, if I share my screen, um, Jill, would you like to direct me and I will drive for you if you'd like to drive, direct me to the, any of the items that you would like me to show publicly and then we can add things to the forward plan for, for, for deep dives, if that makes sense. That would be lovely. Thank you very much. Okay. How is this going to work? Because, ah, there we are. so Thank you're, you're taking that. right. OK, um, can can you initially bring up the rag tables? I, I think the updates can. so that uh, we can see where there are issues. Whoa, that wasn't the not, one not I was that after. One, the other one, yep. The other one. The monthly updates. The monthly fine. update, OK. So and then just go down and if if you could highlight the where they are on red at the moment. So everything that's on here at the moment, uh, uh, Chair, is these are all of the current red items. For this month. OK, so I've, I've got. Count, Councillor Dunseith, you're coming in on, on this item. So I think if we just put RTS into the chat bar and, and we come in on these items as we scroll through. Councillor Dunseith. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. I was just wondering, I'm not quite sure if I'm at, yes, I am on that item, um, about the number of adults with learning disabilities in paid employment because on one of the one of the um the other screens that we've got it does show that we are quite a bit below target and constantly below target and i just wondered to myself i mean obviously we can't find jobs for people and, and get them into employment can't influence that so much but i just wondered is the target set too high? If you have a target and you never meet it, I'm just thinking, is it placed too high? Or is it something to look at, work at and aim for? Because sometimes if it's too high, you're never going to meet it. I just wondered if you could fill in on that a little bit, please, David. Thank you. Can, can I also add into that one? Um, I was concerned the um, the low number of people with learning disabilities that we've got living independently, and I think those two tie in together. Um, I wonder, I think it's probably Vivian to comment on it rather than David. I don't know whether, ah, oh, Vivian, there you go. I wonder whether you could comment on that and whether it's it's something of concern that we may want to look at, in your opinion, in the future. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for, for the question. It's a, it's a really important question. I think um, over over the past year, um, it has been, um, and over the past 18 months, it has been very difficult uh, to, to really progress 
uh, the employment um, for our LD um, residents in a way that we had hoped to be able to do. We've got a real focus on that now uh, and we've got a, uh, a new contract that is due to go out to tender. Uh, I know my colleagues who are on the call, um, Leslie or Steve, would want to sort of uh, come in if you if you want further detail. But, uh, but we are absolutely focused on this as an issue. I think it's important we have a stretching target in this area for all the um, uh, reasons that you've just raised, councillor, that we want it. We are very committed um, across both the council and also our health partners, um, including uh, the voluntary sector and others, that we absolutely focus on this because to ensure that people are included in the community, that have real purpose and engagement and have the ability, like all of us, uh, to take part into employment, training and volunteering. So, so it's a really important target and we would be happy to come back um, with more detail and, and look at how far we have got on this and what we are doing, what actions we are taking and what appetite we are seeing when we go out to retendering the contract. Oh, thank you. Uh, Chair, could I, could I ask that we consider having having another look at this please as suggested yes yeah absolutely C can i just bring in steve please either steve or leslie for any more information they may have at the moment i i was just going to add on what vivian had already said thank you so leslie hutchinson here um corporate director for adult care commissioning so <laughs> just to say that the contract is going to be for a minimum of 50 people per year in year one um, and that the um, evaluations commence on the 18th of October. So we are hoping to get mobilised quite quickly. Um, and I think a deep dive into that and progress, as Vivian has just suggested, is really would be and councillors just suggested would be really helpful actually. But we need a few months for the contract to settle in. Okay, um, uh, Steve, have you got any more to add to this? Councillor, no, I, I had the same as Vivian, so I just wanted to support both of my colleagues in saying this is an area of focus for both of us because this is a um, real area of importance for us. People with learning disability having good subtle accommodation and employment is one of our real drivers for, for doing good outcomes for people, so a real area of focus for us. Okay, that, that is brilliant. Um, Councillor Dunseith, would you be okay if I take this offline and get this scheduled into the forward plan at some time? Yeah, that would be great. Thank okay. you very much, Chairman. Right, Thank yeah, you. No problem. Let me just Jill, make a note. Before, Jill, before we leave this, I put an RTS in. Um, Vivian mentioned into volunteering and the table itself talks about paid employment. Is the contract, this new contract that is being talked about, for volunteering plus paid employment or is it for paid employment um, again because I'm also not so unhappy if people are in volunteering if it is meaningful volunteering that gives p purpose the purpose that you were talking about Vivian to people because sometimes it's more about using the skills that you had previously and want to keep those skills and use those skills. Um, I, I can see that Steve wants to come in as well. Thank you very much, Molly. It's a really, it's a really important issue because it's about all of those three areas. It's, you know, I, th I think the the message that that uh, the directorate wants to get across is that we are ambitious for for our residents and really want to do uh, the best. Uh, a best wit for them and that you know everybody we want to that can get into uh, paid employment that's where we will focus on those people that can be supported and contribute to volunteering that's really important and it builds on that sort of uh, area that, that we're really pushing hard on as we heard right at the beginning of the meeting about how do we build up that community resilience so having the contribution from all of our residents 
uh, that they can take part in that volunteering basis and to feel part of the community in which they live and and want to take and want to be part of is really really important so what the contract will do is to really look at all of those elements across training volunteering and paid work I mean, the, the top end of paid work is really, really important because we should be ambitious. People should expect to get jobs just because of their learning disability does not discount people from help from from being in paid work. So that's where we're going with it. But I can see Steve is is keen to come in on that. So thank you for raising Molly. Really important. The, yeah, and, and thank you very, very much, uh, Vivian, for your response, I think. Paid employment is incredibly important when you think a lot of these people will be on universal credit and the problems that's going to cause in the next few weeks. Um, Steve, would you like to come in and could I just, before I bring you in, Steve, could I ask uh, Councillor Kimber, is this on the same subject? Uh, th th thank you, Jill, for, for allowing me just, to just, Okay, just hang on a second, Steve, then I'll, I'll take Paul first. Yeah, th thank you, Joel, for allowing me to come in and uh, thank you for your great points, uh, Molly. As someone that gave away a thousand pe pizzas yesterday to the uh, to the I Ironman event, which was <laughs> quite enjoyable as a vo working voluntary. Um, but what I wanted to, to prize out a bit more, I represent Portland and we've got probably the highest level of blue collar workers in the county. Um, everybody in and around there if you, if you like the me, the many vans that come and go from the island and looking also at areas that we could develop you know we've got an empty school um we've got the Poma homes hardy block that we've got got to develop for which could be ideal for housing and we've got all these areas and i really want to say you know what um have you got there that we can really develop well thank you Jill. OK, thank you. Slightly off, off topic, but can I, can I just bring Steve in there? I think that's sort of thrown you in the deep end. <laughs> uh, Councilor Zoda, I, I'll have to give just a little bit of thought to uh, that that particular answer. But coming back on the, the point about volunteers, um, it's a really important stepping stone for some people. And I just want to sort of probably um, reiterate Vivian's point on this. For some people, their ambition may well be paid employment. I think we should, as a council, absolutely support and develop people to to, to get to that aim. That should be our eventual aim. But some people um, might take a number of stepping stones to do that. Some of it might be learning and skills development to get on the journey towards paid employment. And one of those other stepping stones might be volunteering opportunities. So don't think of it as a binary choice about either volunteering or employment. Think of it as a spectrum that people might travel along and some people might get to the point of volunteering and then saying, actually, this is as far as I'd like to go. And we need to be able to support that and uh, the range of opportunities for people. But for some people, volunteering may be a really good learning opportunity on taking that further step to then going into employment. So what we want to do, and as uh, Vivian's absolutely set out, is our contract is going to have a range of options for people to have that, that spectrum of learning with the eventual aim and our eventual ambition for people to be into um, paid employment. Um, having given a couple of seconds thought to uh, our, our other question, what I'll be saying is that um, where I see the national success stories of people who do go into employment opportunities with both learning disabilities and let's not forget uh, those people that do suffer from mental ill health or physical disabilities or autism. So we want to be ambitious about all of our people, not just people with learning disabilities. Um, it's about integration into the wider community. So it's not about developing something specific, but it's where we can then have uh, either job carving or job opportunities in a wider range of opportunities. So we wouldn't want to probably develop something specific, uh, something like a school block or something else that kind of um, work hubs, but we would want to make sure that we can um, have a really good range of opportunities for people to be going as an eventual uh, employment opportunity at the end of it. Thank you, councillors. Can I go back to my original point and thank you very much because that's, that has helped because, and actually our last item, we when Jill asked the question about staff and their returning to work. And um, I think it was Claire talked about confidence. And I think as, as this new contract starts, we must take into account that confidence that has gone from a lot of people 
as they take that next step out into, uh, I, I, well, I'm going to say it, a COVID free world as we start to live more normally again. And so I am I'm really pleased to hear that the support into worthwhile volunteering is going to be there. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Molly. And can I bring Vivian in, please, at this point? Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, and, and really helpful points uh, from from both councillors. So thank you. I, th I think it is really important that that we see employment as as a really, really positive opportunity for all of our residents. Uh, to gain traction, to be part of the community and to build that confidence. So uh, really important that we take account of um, the the impact on on particularly some of our more um, uh, frailer and more vulnerable residents, as, as you will have seen and, and has been mentioned throughout this conversation that this morning, the impact of COVID and how we work very closely to build that uh, resilience and understanding about where people are. So hence why volunteering is absolutely key to creating that sort of real stepping stone into, so how can I help? How can I make a difference? And, and how can that also help my own uh, health and well-being? So that's, that, that's the lens that we are going to be working with our uh, new provider, but also in the wider sense with our, our sort of wider uh, resident cohort, as Steve has mentioned, it's not just people with a learning disability, but lots of people have been hugely affected uh, and, you know, both their own mental health and their own ability to cope with anxiety going back out into the world. That's what we will be building on because that was that's what will create resilience in our community. So thank you for, for that really important conversation. I think it's been really useful. Um, I don't want to lose the fact on the housing issue with that, that um, we still be we, we still below what we would like on getting people into independent housing. Can, can I ask David, you'd like to come in? Just 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 quickly, Chair. So um, just as part of that new contract and um, the future deep dive on this, I'd be keen just to evolve that metric slightly. So we're we're not just capturing paid employment. We can get some of the breadth of the conversation we've just talked about here. So uh, we'll, we'll look to add something else in or modify this slightly. So so looking at putting in a metric for how many are volunteering, volunteering for example, I think that that is really useful. Yeah, add some because, further context. Uh, yeah, it puts it into context. Jill, have you seen Andrew's comment in the box? I, th I think, um, yeah. Good. Cause you I, think, I think that's slightly different, isn't it? It's talking about affordable housing need on Portland yeah. specifically. But using the sites intelligently, so yeah. 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 Okie doke. Right. That was really, really useful. So I think we're going ahead with that and I'll look at getting something scheduled on the forward plan um, around adults with learning disabilities. Right. Sorry, David, where were we? <laughs> so uh, I suppose, uh, um, okay, Chair, can, if, if there's go, anyone go. else who would like to move to the a different metric that they Okay. If, if we can go back to where we were, I, I'd like That's to certainly. bring up the hospital discharges uh, and the bed occupancy mm -hmm. issue. Can, can I just have confirmation? We've got a paper next month or next for the next meeting on um, adult care market sufficiency. Will will that bring in the discharge from hospital issues that are coming up at the moment? Uh, Chair, is it OK for, for me to come in just before um... Uh, if, if there's questions for Steve and Leslie. Um, yes is the short answer. Uh, we will be bringing in uh, the impact on, so we'll be looking at the market strategy paper at, at the deep dive, but what we'll also be pulling in and cannot uh, uh, not talk about is the impact of hospital discharge and where it impacts and how it's impacted. So that will be very much part of the market management uh, paper that's coming next month. All right, good. OK, I'm starting to think this is going to be an all day meeting next month, looking at some of the, the items that we've got on there. 
but um, I'll, I'll take that offline at the moment. Um, right, we've got Councillor Dunseith coming in on freedom of information. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I, I noticed I picked up that the freedom of information requests answered on time is not particularly good for children and I believe adults as well. And, and I wondered if we could uh, have a little bit more background about that, please, because I think freedom of information requests, um, I, I know they take a lot of time, they can be complicated, but they are, they are important. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Would any, any officer like to comment on the, the FOI requests that we're getting in and the, the time scales behind them? silence out there yeah <laughs> so, so, sorry I was, oh. I was trying to uh, i was trying to uh un unblock myself i do apologize um i think it's fair to say that um in some areas we'd be much slower than we would have done so in uh pre-covid times um mm. some of them uh have gone through a process that we could have got to the timing much sooner so uh, I think there's work both corporately and um, within the director, directorate to make sure that we are on top of those that we need to be responding to and signposting people to those that are uh, already on the website where that information can be found and that we are get, making sure that we've got those signed off in a way that's that's much tighter and much slicker and those very crunchy ones that are difficult to do that we focus on those priority um, areas, but those that we can point people into general information, that's what we're going to be doing. And we need to just be uh, making sure that we're all consistent with that approach. Uh, David, I don't know whether there's anything that you wanted to add on that from a corporate position. Only to say at the moment, certainly in the adult space, even if you look at the, um, at the numbers, steadily improving and actually beyond target at the moment for adults. So there has been an improvement uh, and we're very much in a good space at the moment. Uh, not not so much in some other areas, but for, for the, the reasons you've mentioned, and uh, I know a lot of work is going on in the background, particularly around that information sharing piece, uh, so that we have, you know, essentially frequently asked questions that, that there isn't the continual need to answer the same piece of information. Um, but it, it, yes, I suppose it, we could look at that in future months to see how that work is progressing. Thank you. Okay, if, if I can just come in here, I have had a conversation with um, Councillor Bartlett, who chairs the Parallel Scrutiny Committee to this, and they are also concerned about it. Um, we were talking about if there's any future work, whether we do a joint piece of scrutiny work between the two committees, because it is something that does span both of us. Um, Councillor Dunseith, would you be okay if I take that one offline and talk to the other chairman and just get some sort of thoughts as to where we want to go forward on this? Absolutely, Chair. And I think working together, um, combined, uh, doing a, a joint, having a joint look at it would be a very good idea. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you because, because I think it's something across the organisation that we are fairly weak on at the moment. and because you know it's stupid just us doing something and, and Councillor Bartlett's count, um, committee doing virtually the same. So we need to look look together. I haven't had time chance to have a look at his agenda yet, but I believe has he got he may have an agenda item actually on that for tomorrow. So um, we'll see where we go to on that and I'll, I'll, I'll report back to the committee. Right, have we got anything else? I've I've got some questions around the housing parts of this, okay. but I can't remember where they were. I did have the numbers for them, and I've now lost the numbers. Um, These look, around look, bed look, and breakfast. Look, I, yeah, yeah, I was going to look at. Um, I was somebody else asked oh i think it was councillor island asked about bed and breakfast can can i jump in first and ask about um where we've accepted a duties where we've accepted a duty of homelessness 
to residents and the likelihood of the increase in numbers on that. I was quite concerned that um, where we have accepted a duty, I think there was a comment in there that it's high and it's likely to get higher, particularly with the relief duties that are coming through. And I have asked David, um, David Bell, Andrew Villany, if um, he could respond on that. So I see he's just put his camera on. So if I can go over to you, please, Andrew, just to talk us on the homelessness duty and the relief duties and what we're doing about it. Um, happy to. It's quite a complex um, and moving piece of piece of activity, isn't it? Obviously, but the, at the moment we've been expecting a an increase in uh, in demand because of the eviction ban, because landlords being able to uh, to go to court to get possession of their of their properties. Um, we're not finding that to be as high as we expected. Certainly not currently. But what we've, we're finding another another pressure, which is also of, should be of concern to to us as a council, which is about the um, uh, general unavailability and unaffordability of private rented um, properties. So we're working hard with the landlord sector to try to find more supply of available uh, housing in the private rented sector because um, it's not so much evictions, but people when people are coming to the end of a tenancy, they, they normally would find another one. Um, but at the moment, um, the price has gone up. Um, there's the increase at the certainly the, at the current season. There's uh, attraction within the uh, holiday holiday let market and some properties have been sold to uh, people coming to Dorset as a place to work post pandemic so there are there are some issues within the within the housing uh, market which are putting pressure on people who are coming to us uh, homeless because they aren't getting them they aren't being able to find their normal alternatives so it's not quite the same as having to go through the court system but it's people who just come to the natural end of a of a tenancy and trying to find another one and we we are finding um, this is post probably pandemic related. We're finding a, a rise in uh, what we call family evictions, so people being asked to leave leave their leave their family home, and a slightly worrying increase in uh, the number of um, uh, people with children, couples with children, or single parents with children being living in their their parents uh, being being asked to leave. So there are there are there is a rise of demand, but it isn't quite as crude as um, something we can re re relate to the to the eviction ban being listed. So it's a complicated answer. I can provide I can certainly provide statistics on it, but it's a quite a sort of a, a spread of impact. I'll give a, maybe a stat that would, would help um, on the 16 families that we have in bed and breakfast at the moment, which is too many. Um, but of those 16, six are uh, there as a result of family eviction. So it has to leave by their their own mum and dad. So it's higher than we would normally expect, so six out of 16. And four of those, number, four out of the 16 are private rented um, tenancies ending, the eviction ban issue that we were expecting, lower than we would have expected. Um, and there are other reasons uh, which I can share with the group, uh, relationship breakdown, two cases of domestic abuse, and um, one eviction from social housing, for example. So we are finding a rise, but it's a complicated, complicated picture. What we're doing about it um, is, doing much more intensive work at prevention stage, because that was part of your question, Jill, I think, mm -hmm. um, doing home visits in all cases of family eviction to try to persuade um, families not to um, ask their, ask their um, offspring to leave um, and do, do much more intensive prevention work face to face, because we haven't been able to do that during the pandemic period, just to make sure we can get, get tighter about stopping, you know, stemming the flow there. Um, and the other, at the other end, the thing I started off speaking about, um, putting our accommodation finding resource, the, the, the staff looking at accommodation, they've spent a lot of the summer, a lot of the previous year looking for accommodation for the Rough Sleeper initiative. Um, the intention, the um, shift of focus now is very much about getting family accommodation because that's where we're finding most of that, the, the, the current pressure. Um, all of this is important, but we're finding particular peak of, um, of uh, presentations through families. Sorry, long answer, but uh, happy to answer any more questions. OK, thank you. I've got, I've got Councillor Rennie coming in here. I think I know what question she's going to ask, actually. Well, Would you like no, to come in, Molly? I, no, I'm not going to ask a question. I'm actually going to make a comment here because hearing Andrew talk about family evictions. Um, interestingly, I sit on a, a charity. I'm a trustee where we give grants to young people for education or in apprenticeships and we've got five we are looking at today 
three, two of those five are young people who have been evicted from the family mm. home. They haven't left to go to uni. Uh, both of them are continuing their education as a young adult locally. But again, families who can no longer keep their young person in the home or they can't find some sort of accommodation locally. Uh, and that actually has really surprised me. That's the first time I've ever seen that as well. And maybe that's a hidden homeless that we wouldn't normally be coming across. Can I, can I, can mm. I just yeah, come back? Please, please come back. Thank you, Molly. I mean, that's, that's partly reinforces the point I was making about the lack of availability of the normal availability of uh, somebody generally would find a flat for their son and daughter um, yeah. and without without coming to us but that's because of the drying up of that availability it's getting to come to us or reaching the point where they feel necessarily necessary to evict them or, the, or move, move them out yes i think i think just talking about b and b's as well there's there's a statistic somewhere about the number of ladies who are in B&B &B that have been in there for more than six weeks and are expecting babies and are pregnant. I don't know whether you've got any comment on that. I found that that statistic quite confusing because it's as a percentage and I don't quite know. You know, 30, I think it was 12 and a half percent, 13 and a half percent of what? basically. Shall I, shall I give you the actual number? Yeah, the, um, the, actually the actual number within those sort of statistics, those sort of um, metrics would be far more useful than a percentage. Um, perhaps David and I could talk about maybe presenting it that way in future, I agree. So if the the number of uh, f families in um, bed and breakfast more than uh, in total is 16 out of 88 at the moment. So the majority of people in Households in bed and breakfast are single and or childless couples, but we have 16 um, in bed and breakfast, and seven of those have been seven of those families have been longer than six weeks. Um, we don't want to get back to the peak of we were doing well. Uh, we're getting getting down to twos and threes, uh, but part of the, what I've just been describing is we do need when when people present the immediate we do use uh, bed and breakfast as emergency accommodation for the short term. Uh, but we have as a consequence of the peak of that demand is we've got more than we would have we would want uh, staying for longer than six weeks. Sorry, short answer seven. OK, Can thank you. I ask as well, Jill, those mm. two for domestic abuse in B&B, &B, is this because there's no refuge space? I'd have to look into that, Molly, because as you, as you know, there are there are refuge spaces available. I'll, I'll work. I'll look at the individual those individual cases. Cause that's yeah. Really place. Thank you. OK, right. Um, the other part, I don't know, it's, is Councillor Ireland still on, on the meeting in the meeting? Because I think you've got OK, because I think you've got questions about the affordable housing, haven't you? And houses brought back into use? Did I? I can't remember. <laughs> you told me you did. <laughs> Which metric was that? I can't um, um, AD 18 and AD 23. That's what we were looking at. Oh, I remember seeing his email, yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It Well, the, the obvious thing is we, we don't seem to have as many, I think. Um, we're not delivering. <sighs> I think yes, it it was around the delivering of of affordable housing, wasn't it? Obviously, Councillor Kimber has just raised it earlier as well, um, but um, I think we should probably point out that we need affordable housing everywhere, not just Portland. And the, and actually, Nick, as well, you meant sorry to talk for you, but you mentioned bringing back homes into use. I think. Shall I answer the question in terms of in terms of target and um, meeting the target? Our annual target for affordable housing is 300, which we're on track to meet. Uh, we we do need more in quantum terms because we the the demand for housing on the register and homelessness is is higher than that that number can can satisfy. But just pure terms on in terms of meeting the target, we're on track. Um, and if you're interested as a as a committee, we can certainly find provide more detail on 
that sits underneath this around the empty homes work that we do. Um, it's relatively small numbers, but we do um, bring back empty homes into use, um, including the plots in, in Blandford, for example. Um, there are There is work that we do which we can provide some detail um, to, to sit, sit underneath this so that these performance targets. So the, uh, on that 300 number, uh, we're on track. We're on track to meet it. Um, I, I, I think got, if I can make a point, floor, so there is there is a sort of just briefly the, the Homes England um, Homes England have announced a 5.2 billion pounds national program to invest in uh, affordable housing, and we are talking to all of the the there are, there are eight no less um, housing association partnerships that operate within Dorset with money. So we, we're talking to them about how they can invest that in in um, in Dorset to build more than their target. So we are we are pushing on this. Sorry, I interrupted. No, it's fine. But I, I think I think most of us would agree that the, whilst we've got a target, which I think we exceeded by one or two last year, you know, as you just <laughs> alluded to, it's it's a target which seemingly is easy to hit, but it's actually inadequate in terms of providing what people, you know, the people of Dorset need. Um, so you, you could argue that the target is 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 wrong because you know we should be maybe looking at a thousand houses a year. You know, well, what's the point of having? Well, I guess what I'm saying is, what's the point of having a target which we can meet, but it's actually not, you know, really solving any issues. Um, can I just say that and that aside, I, would, I can assure uh, members that we would, we're not resting and thinking, great, we've met 300, we'll stop. It's a, it's, a, it's pushing to, met, to, to to get as many as we possibly can, and that's the language that Councillor Carr Jones and I have use when we when we talk to the registered providers, the housing associations, particularly in the context of them having been granted a lot of money by by Homes England. I've got is that OK, Councillor Ireland? Are you OK? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I've got Councillor Taylor and Councillor Kimber wanting to come in. If I could take Councillor Taylor next, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Board. Uh, yeah, this was raised last week of people in scrutiny with the fact of the saying accommodation required in Dorset. Um, we didn't actually get the figures of what type of accommodation is available. And this is where I think we need to look at it properly, because, for example, like a family needs a three bedroom house. We have no idea because we've got th houses available, but we don't know the accommodation that's required in it. So therefore, I, I really would like to see the figures updated for what is actually available within the county, as in how many bedrooms per house, because we have no idea. So we're stabbing in the dark when we say, oh, yeah, we've got family who need a three, three bedroom house. Have we? No idea. Where's, what's, what's available? Because the last count, if I remember rightly, about two years ago, we only had one four bedroom house in Dorset entirely available. So there's there's the question that I wish to raise is the fact is, do we know what accommodation is out there so we can actually fill the places properly? That's this, the question. This is almost going back to the old housing needs survey, yeah. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. It's just it's just not the information is not there. So when yeah. I look at things and I say, OK, we, we need accommodation for this. Have we got it? Graham. I think Graham's coming in and, and so is Andrew. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Um, shall I do it, Graham? Just I can answer. I mean, there, there's there are sure, there, there, there are details and statistics out there that can answer your question. I mean, they're, they're in terms of the the pipeline of the, the 300 we're we're building, we know what size they are, and we know when when we're going to expect them. The the bit that's unpredictable is uh, when we get a property available, when we get a relet, what we call a relet, or somebody gives up a four bedroom house or whatever, when we would certainly use that for a person on our register. Um, what you're hinting, what you're uh, alluding to, though, there is a short, particular shortage of larger family homes. Um, um, but it, to, to, to answer your question, the specific numbers we can we can share uh, around that um, the, the new build program because we do know what we're getting and when. Mm. So there isn't, there, isn't there aren't no four bedroom houses within uh, within Dorset, um, uh, but okay. there, there, there are there are too few. Yeah, I, I gather that, and that's why I'm aiming this question to say. Before we speculate on graphs and whatever, you know, the fact is that do we have the base information? We don't. And that's what's concerning me because the fact is we're actually stabbing in the dark here. We do. We do. We do. I think I think uh, if I can just come in, Viv Vivian has just come in and said it might be useful to do a bit more of a deep dive yes. onto this yes, to look absolutely. at what housing we've got, what accommodation there is, if there's going to be an interest in that with a committee. Um, 
I certainly would like to, to do a bit more on that. Gray, Graham, you've come in on this as well. I don't know whether yeah. you want to comment at all at the moment. Uh, I've come in late because I've just come from planning appeal, so I'm I'm picking okay. up on the phone for a little bit. Um, but but obviously your David Bond is taking you through um, the performance management of housing, so that's what yeah. you're picking on. But how, however, you know, I mean, hearing some you know the previous comments about the you know are the targets high enough? They, they're realistic. You know, if you put an unrealistic target and you just keep missing it, it's not realistic. Um, so I think, but yeah, let's let's do a deep dive. You know, I mean, I'm quite happy to do that, Chairman. I think it's interesting. I mean, it was disappointing that the numbers that came to the housing new, new housing allocations and um, thing the other the thing that we did the other day was so low. You know, um, because there was a lot of questions answered there that are relevant to this. Thanks, Chair. Thank so you. Thanks. That's, that's really, yeah. really, really, really great. Honestly, it's it's uh, it's been bugging me for about nearly six months because we don't actually know, and that's what what the question is. What have we got? We what stock have we got? Yeah. We do know. Okay. Can 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 we can we move on from this? Thank I you. think, um, Councillor Kimber, did you have anything to add to this, or are you happy if we look at doing a bit of a deep dive into this topic? Well, I've just got one area, Jill. If I may, just make it and. and uh, Thank you for Graham reminding me that I missed the meeting. I, I assure you, I was double booked and couldn't get out of the meeting. Uh, but I've asked, uh, I've asked Haley for uh, the transcript. Um, yeah, David make, makes a good point about the need for four bedroom. But the point I wanted to raise, uh, we've said housing associations, uh, and I'm thinking if we've got a um, and I'm thinking in my own ward, got kind a of private develop with a large block. Would that include? Would, would that count? That's the question, uh, Chair. Okay, I don't know whether anybody wants to pick that up, or whether we want to leave that for the deep dive. And Andrew, do you want to comment? Didn't quite catch. Didn't quite. Didn't, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Did, do you want to come in again on, on the question yeah, yeah, fairly briefly? To, Paul? Yeah, at the beginning of the pre this part of the presentation, you uh, named five housing associations oh, yeah. that you will be working with. My question is, um, I have a, a private company with a large block and the question is, is this housing association money only or can it go out? Thanks. Um, um, I, th I think that's, that's, that I probably need, do need to talk to you separately uh, about the particular particular blocks of certain commercial confi confidentiality. I'm happy to do that. The, I can answer your earlier question about the, the partner organisations. All of the main housing associations we work with have secured part of this £5.2 billion. Pounds. So ASTA, Sovereign, Magna, organisation called ABRI, which is a new, new merged organisation. Uh, Stonewater Guinness. So all the major ones are um, uh, have a, a portion of that money to to invest. So that, I think that's good news for us actually, um, because that's they're all interested in talking to us about what they can do uh, across the county. So um, broadly, that's encouraging. I can I can talk to you separately about that particular site. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, there's an awful lot of chatter in the chat bar at the moment. Um, which I think I'm going to call it, draw a line under this conversation at the moment and just ask for, we'll just have a look at it afterwards and work out how we're going to take this piece of work forward. Um, probably as, as Vivian has suggested, it might be quite useful because of the interest in this topic. Is there any other item within the performance management that members would like to bring up, please? I'll just give you a couple of seconds to put RTS in. It's quiet. Woo. I think that, I think that is it then. You've so, given us so much work already now. <laughs> I know. I, I, I sort of thought, do I do this or don't I? But no, because there could be something else. But I, I haven't got any more RTSs in the chat bar. So thank you very much, David. You've certainly stimulated a lot of discussion this morning on this and thank you very much for the councillors who've taken part in this and thank you for Andrew for coming in at the last minute. Um, right, going forward then we're on to all we've got left now are our forward plans 
and um, the cabinet forward plan. So page 53 is our forward plan. We've got quite a busy meeting um, in November already. There's some quite big meaty things on there. Um, and then don't forget that we've got the budget scrutiny as we did it last year. We're doing budget scrutiny again in December and then we're on to January. So um, at the moment, I haven't got anything else to add into that apart from the working groups that we've still got running. Um, if we can, I don't know if anybody has got anything they want to add to the forward plan, please drop me an email and we'll have a look at it, preferably on, on one of the eight forms that are a scrutiny request form. Um, it just makes that so much easier for officers to understand what is being asked for. So the scrutiny request form are available. Please have a look at them and fill things in when you come across things. We've then got the um, cabinet forward plan. I haven't picked up anything on there that I would like to look at at the moment. But once again, if there's anything on there that any member would like to put into the forward plan, please either say no or drop me an email on that. And I'm hoping that is all right. Everyone seems very quiet at the moment. So what I think I'll do is go on to, oh, we've got an R RTS, um, Councillor Taylor. Sorry, Chair, thank you for bringing this back in. A uh, comment from Andrew Bellaney is just in the chat bar, as you can see, and says, uh, et cetera, et cetera, deep dive. I can provide information on how many we re-let last year. The thing is that I'm trying to say, which I'm going back to, is the fact is we need to know today. We need to know the facts rolling ongoing, because if we don't, we can't help. And that's the question. I, I don't really want to go backwards on the agenda. Do you, okay, do you think right. this is it's something that you could pick up with, with Andrew outside of the meeting, please? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Okay, Absolutely. do that later. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, right, item 10, urgent items. I take it there are no urgent items, not that I've heard, and we have no exempt business. So I'd like to call an end to this meeting. I'd like to thank everybody who's come today, all the officers who have presented, all the councillors that have taken part. I think it's been a really good meeting and thank you for the portfolio holders and anybody else that I can think of. So thank you so much and I'll see you all on the 1st of November. Thank you, Chair. Excellent meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.